I would like to call the May 5th meeting of the City of Santa Cruz Planning Commission to order. Could we have a roll call, please? Commissioner Conway. Here. Greenberg. Here. Kennedy. Maxwell. Here. Ms. C.D. Miller. I see him here. Here. Thank you. Jeffrey? Here. Sarah Dawson? Here. Thank you. Uh, are there any statements of disqualification? I don't think we have any action items, so, but any statements of disqualification for this evening? Hearing none, we will uh, move to oral communications. This is the time for members of the public to address the commission. On the agenda items, uh, on the agenda the uh, could we have staff mute? We have some feedback coming through. Uh, we're on to oral communications. Uh, this is time for any members of the public to address the planning commission for agenda items that are not on the agenda tonight. So items not on the agenda. And at this time, could we have any um, members of the public who would like to address the commission, please raise your hand. You can do that by pressing star nine on your phone. So we'll give a second for the lag here. Okay, last call for any members of the public who would like to speak during oral communications, which is for non-agenda items this evening. Clerk, I do not see any hands. Could you go ahead and confirm? That's that is correct. correct. Okay, thank you. We'll move along to approval of the minutes. We have two sets of minutes to approve, minutes for March 3rd and the minutes of March 17th. Um, I would entertain a motion to approve those minutes at this time, <laughs> or if there's any changes or edits. I'll move the minutes. I'll second. Okay, could we have a roll call vote for approval of the minutes for March 3rd and uh, March 17th, motion by Commissioner Schifrin and seconded by Commissioner Kennedy. Could we have a roll call, please. Commissioner Conway. Aye. Greenberg. Aye. Maxwell. Aye. Kennedy. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. Jeff Aye. Aye. Okay, moving right along, we're moving to general business and we're having a staff report on the downtown plan expansion project, uh, review of the department of uh, scenarios. Staff, could we have a report, please? Hi, good evening, everyone. My name is Sarah Noisy. I'm a senior planner in the advanced planning division. And um, I am here tonight with our consultant team made up of Bill Wiseman, uh, Justin Duell, and hopefully Matt Thompson will be able to join us shortly. And um, we are going to be going through um, some like the background of the project, how what we've gotten done so far. Um, on this project to expand the boundary of our existing downtown plan into the area south of Laurel. And then we're gonna go through the materials that we have created around um, sort of what are the development scenarios that we're considering in this area um, and taking us through to um, discussion with your commission to gather further input, answer questions and um, start to shape what are the um, components that are going to go into a preferred development scenario. Yeah, um, Nathan Lee, and Catherine are both on. Lee, can you mute your mic, please? Yeah, both CCTV and Lee. Apologies. Me, we're having feedback from both of you. Thank you. Um, so uh, those components that will go into a preferred scenario that will get studied under um, on EIR that will start um, Hope we're hoping to kick off later this summer. So, um, Bill, if you could um, share the presentation from your screen, we'll go ahead and get started. Okay, give me a second here. Okay. You hear us. Um, 
Okay, is that it? Yep, great. So let's go ahead and advance to the next slide. So um, I already introduced myself. I'd also like to introduce our consultant team. So Bill Wiseman is our um, prime consultant with Kim Lee Horn, who's really like carrying the vision for this and bringing this whole uh, project together for us. He's working with Justin Duell um, at Dolan Group, who's uh, been responsible for helping us visualize and um, model some of these development scenarios and think about how um, development can actually fit together. And then Matt Thompson is a local architect that has um, just decades of experience in Santa Cruz and is bringing um, insight into the um, just the character of the city. And then um, he's been Matt, Matthew's been working really hard on getting the cross sections for the civic spaces, the public space, the streetscapes pulled together. So next slide, please. So we're gonna go over um, an overview of the project and then sort of summarize the work that's been done so far. We'll talk about, Bill will talk briefly about um, the community, our first round of community engagement and the survey that we put out as well as um, the highlights of our real estate market overview study. Um, and then he'll go into um, the open house station topics. So we there was a lot of information that we, put together and had at our open house um, on April 20th that I think some of you were able to attend, which was great. And, um, and so we'll go through that and then we'll have time for discussion at the end, which is of course the, the main point of tonight is to hear from your commission. So project overview, let's go through it. So the context for this project is, as I mentioned, we are expanding the boundary of our downtown plan, which is shown here in blue. That's the existing boundary that's part of the downtown plan. Um, and we're looking at expanding it into the area that is in that red, uh, shown in red there. That's our project area, what we call the zone or the project area. Um, and that will, so we'll also then be amending the beach south of Laurel plan, the boundaries of which are shown in green on this map. So we'll essentially be, um, you know, taking this area out of the beach south of Laurel plan and making it part of the downtown plan um, as part of this process. Up to 10. Um, so just a little bit of background on the downtown plan itself. This was originally written in the early 90s as the city was recovering from the Loma Prieta earthquake in 89. We've done updates to it over the past two decades um, in the early 2000s and the mid 2010s. Most recently um, in 2018, we increased height and allowed more residential uses in the core of our downtown. And we have seen that be a really effective. We've seen, as your commission is no doubt aware, many more residential um, project proposals in our downtown since adding that additional increment of height um, in certain areas. So I just wanna be clear for members of the public that might be listening in, you know, a plan sets allowances for development and um, looks at what could be built and what might be built. And it does, it's not a, you know, a dictate of what has to be built. It sets allowances that private developers can then come in and use and develop within. Um, so that's what we're talking about doing is setting new allowances for this area that's south of Laurel Street. Um, our, this plan is broken down into areas, this downtown plan, uh, neighborhood areas. And each of those neighborhood areas has slightly different um, conditions set for um, you know, the size of development that can be built there, the intensity of development, and the types of uses that are expected in each of those different neighborhoods. There are some of these neighborhoods that are really um, intended more for preservation rather than change. So um, I, I think as we move south of Laurel, we are looking at creating uh, an area for more change. And I just want to acknowledge that um, we do have things in our plans that sometimes do call for preservation and maintaining things as well. So this project is funded by two grant funding sources, our regional early action planning grant and a local early action planning grant. I think that's what the L stands for in LEAP. Um, and for both for both of those funding sources, the primary like uh, category that we ticked in order to qualify for funding is that this project aims to increase the, the housing capacity for the city. So that's the primary thing that we're after. Um, and we're also gonna be looking at ways that economic opportunity could be increased with this. So space for new local businesses, space for employment space for local workers. Um, the project will include drafting a, an EIR under the California Environmental Quality Act, so an, an environmental impact report, typically a project of this size, we expect that to take a little bit less than a year. And so these grant funding sources are really crucial for the city to be able to pursue this work. Um, at a total of $450,000, that's gonna fund the bulk of this work um, with Kimley Horn uh, and their team. Next slide. 
Okay, so our project study area is a total of 29 acres. Um, you know, we are including areas in the San Lorenzo River just in um, and on both sides of all the streets that we are that border the, the um, core of the project area, just to indicate that we're we're intending to plan for all of these areas. We're going to have policies about the levee trail. We're going to have policies about um, streetscape and streetway and street and circulation improvements. And so that's why we're showing, you know, the, those boundaries going out a little ways. Um, but this is the area. Sorry, can we just go back. <laughs> I'll just. <Sorry. laughs> um, just to orient you everyone a little bit so um, of course the key features in this area are the warriors arena which you see on the um, middle right side of your screen there that's their existing arena um, we have the 555 pacific project which is at the low at the bend there between pacific and front street um, and then we have sort of a scattering of other uses in this area some of which are very well established and um, you know like have been really longtime tenants and others, um, others of which are sort of like new and upcoming. This is the area, of course, where 130, the 130 Center Street project will um, will be built eventually. It's yeah, just right there where Bill's pointing. So that's sort of a little bit of an orientation here. Directly to the to the west of this um, is a neighborhood that carries zoning for neighborhood conservation. So um, we didn't think that would be an appropriate area to plan for more growth. The whole point of um, neighborhood conservation zoning is preserving that existing character and having policies in place to encourage investment in those existing homes and structures. So um, that's hence the that's sort of the origin of this boundary that you see here um, is that we are leaving that area alone, that neighborhood conservation zone and focusing on really like where are the biggest parcels, where where's the existing commercial development where there, um, you know, there's really potential for interest development interest to be coming in in the next sort of two to three decades that's typically the timeline we're planning on and so we'll talk about the goals um, our initial objectives for this uh for this plan so as i mentioned at the beginning adding multifamily housing is really top of mind that's one of the primary goals here we also want to create opportunities for public amenities and improvements to infrastructure so parks looking harder at the um, levee trail um, other spaces for community use and you'll see as we get further into that you know um, we have some significant opportunities to create some new spaces for the city um, we want to better connect downtown and the river that's one of the primary reasons that we chose this location to expand the downtown plan looking at the area south of downtown because there has been sort of this like um, there has been this desire um, articulated in various plans over time to connect downtown to the river and make it, you know, that circulation more seamless, make it easier for visitors that are coming to the beach to find our downtown and engage with our local businesses and really see what is, you know, the true heart of Santa Cruz, which is our downtown. Um, so we're also looking for economic opportunities for local businesses and workers in this area, which there's a lot of potential here, um, which of course, economic activity does generate tax revenue that supports city services, which serve all, uh, all city residents and visitors. We wanna look at improving pedestrian and bicycle experience. So thinking about mobility, thinking about connections, and then thinking about the streetscapes and the, um, the physical facilities that are built for pedestrians and bicyclists is a significant component of this plan. And then also, of course, we're working with the warriors. They're interested in finding a site and, um, uh, setting some some allowances that would allow them to build a permanent modern sports arena, um, which is not a facility that you know we have really in the Monterey Bay region. It's like a a modern sports facility, so that is a significant component of the plan as well. Okay, so next slide. Okay, so just a little a brief overview of our work program and schedule. So we, we kicked this off last summer um, and rolled right into the project discovery phase, which included um, doing background mapping, background information, real estate market report, um, and kicking off our initial phase of community outreach, which Bill will talk more about, um, you know, our the meeting we had, the survey we did, the results that we got from that effort. Um, we're in this phase right now of evaluating these development scenarios and gathering, you know, developing them, creating them, and now gathering feedback so that we can start talking about like what are the down, what are the amendments that we want to pursue to the downtown plan, sort of what's the scope of that. And, and then that will allow us to start 
um, our CEQA process in July, which, you know, as I mentioned earlier, we expect that to take, you know, nine months about. So I think that's showing 10, which is, yeah, right on, right, right in the ballpark. And then we're looking at public hearings for... So the, I, I, I can't speak to what goes on in your Hey CTV, we can thing. hear your conversation in the background. That I don't know. TV, we need you guys to mute or keep it down in there because we can definitely hear you. So one more time, CCTV, we can hear you. So please um, refrain from speaking. Thanks. Go ahead, sir. Thank you, Chair. Um, so that puts us um, at public hearings and adoption uh, next summer. So about a year from where we are now, we'll be bringing back um, final draft of the downtown plan amendments and a final and a draft EIR for review with the planning commission and city council. So next slide. And so at this point, I'm gonna hand it over to Bill Wiseman, um, who's gonna talk through the results of what we found during our project discovery phase. Okay, thank you, Sarah. Everyone, can you hear me? Sarah, can I have a thumbs up from you? Yep, okay, great. Um, good evening, everybody. I'm just gonna go talk about first is what happened in our project discovery. And so what we did to get started is we uh, created a, a engagement website, it's a social media website. And on that, we did uh, a community survey. We had this, um, what we call the ideas wall where people could post, post comments on various topics and we had an interactive map where they could actually post comments specifically in a spatial manner um, in the project area. We got uh, quite a good amount of feedback. We had over 1100 1, total visits and um, I'd say the key is with the survey responses we got 88 people that responded to that and then with the posting of the comments as well. In total there's probably over 400 written comments that we received either in responding to questions in the survey or through the ideas well or the interactive map. So it was a really good um, response rate that we got. So I'm just gonna hit just uh, highlights of a couple or few of the um, survey responses that I think are most salient. First one, it is, tells us is how many times people um, come down to Kaiser Permanente. And uh, it's, I, I was amazed at the number. We've got 11 or more is like nearly 40%. So. People come down and they use it quite a bit. Um, how do they get there? Typically by cars, which is partly to be expected just because it's a regionally serving uh, facility, um, but it's also an indication of the issues associated with parking um, and how that occurs, which is actually good because it's on an off peak time. So it tends to work well. And with that context, um, what do people do when they get here? Because they need to walk, from the various garages and other surface parking spaces that's in the city, they uh, usually do something else. They go to a bar or restaurant either before or after the event. This slide is one of the questions we ask is please rank how important following urban design features are. And if you look at the slide, the greens and the blues are what is considered more important and the yellows and the reds less important. So if you kind of look at it, the, the first three are really dealing with the civic spaces and the you know, what happens at the streetscape and mobility. And those are very important to, to people. And on the, the last three on the right side is really looking at the architecture and the built form. And interesting there, um, obviously quality of materials and architectural details, but building heights was not as important to them as, as other components. So we thought that was an interesting takeaway from the survey. Overall uh, conclusions, just to try to summarize it in one slide, a lot of comments about the area not being feeling that they're safe and generally that it's underutilized and underdeveloped. Um, the area should be redeveloped. There was a, certainly a, a like, hey, let's go do something. One person said revamp it all. Um, but when you do it, do it with a mix of restaurants, entertainment and housing and very strong theme on those those three types of uses. Um, as evident by the survey, streetscape, civic spaces and connectivity are higher, very high priorities and a lot of people responding saying, keep the warriors. So we got a lot of support for um, finding a new permanent facility for the warriors. Uh, just very briefly on the market overview, generally speaking, there's a very strong housing market as we know, and we're seeing with other projects. Um, and that seems to be one of the biggest from a real estate standpoint development opportunity. 
office not quite as strong. So the recommendation was that it should be encouraged, but may or not may or may not may or may not be developed in the near term. So a um, little bit less. The market's not as strong, um, but that's not to say that there isn't a market for office. And then finally, with retail, uh, new ground floor retail should be encouraged. But also the recommendation was to uh, encourage some sort of flexibility for tenanting so that you don't end up having you know, vacant spaces at the ground floor if the market isn't strong enough. So both the outreach um, effort and the, down to the real estate market overview, these are available on the city's website and there's reports that summarize in uh, considerable detail for both of these. So the next thing that we did um, after the discovery phase was to start thinking about what uh, this place might look like and really start to brainstorm and working with city staff, um, Justin and Matthew and myself and talking about parking issues and design and all sorts of things. And really um, came to a culmination of dealing with a vision in two contexts. And that's kind of gonna be my theme as I get through this is, is what happens in the public realm and then what happens in the development space. And we put together those materials and thought it would be great to have a, an open house, uh, which was nice because we were able to, to you know, physically engage with people rather than just through um, Zoom calls, et cetera. So we had an open house just a couple of weeks ago on the 20th, and we were able to have that at the um, Kaiser Permanente um, arena that was hosted by the Warriors. So what we did is we had seven stations. So people came in and they got an overview of the project. And then um, there were these various uh, stations and you can see the titles here in the screen. And the format was to include a series of boards and um, people manning those stations. So or, you know, people, I shouldn't use the word manning, people uh, <laughs> facilitating at, the, at the, each of the stations. And uh, we also had a large board and we provided post-it notes. So that's the way we were able to get a lot of comments. So we got 150 people came to the open house and we got 190 written comments on each of these topic areas. So really great feedback from the community um, and what they'd like to see and, and what their response to the concepts that we promoted to them or, or communicated to them. So I'm gonna go uh, in a clockwork, clockwise direction starting with circulation and streetscape. So the, what you're seeing here on this slide on the left side is a diagram of the existing circulation. And because mobility and circulation is, is one of the key components for that the public was expressing, we started to look at, well, how could this function, particularly with the arena being relocated or in its existing place? So the slide of the image on the right is showing you some of these concepts. Um, one of them is to think about putting a um, alley along the back side here to connect uh, these blocks and provide basically access into these skinnier, smaller parcels, but not having driveways on, on uh, fronting on Pacific Avenue. The idea within Spruce Street, which you see crossing this way with, the, with my marker, is that to program that and try to really think about creating a civic space and so, and, and changing the functionality or allowing flexibility and how that street is function or is, um, is used and programmed. So both that would occur both in this concept on Spruce Street, which could be partially closed over here and potentially permanently closed west of Front Street. But then also the concept along Pacific Avenue is to create what's called flex zones. And I'll show you what that means. There also is the idea of putting a new roundabout down at the corner here where Front Street and Pacific Avenue connect. And that's important, not just for functionality, but also safety. It's a very dangerous intersection. There's a lot going on and a lot of strange geometry. So there's an opportunity to fix that. And then the last thing is to think about what we thought about was how we can open up the river and not have roads in front in, you know, between buildings and, and the levee and the river itself. So you can see where the, you've got the Laurel Street extension. It's a one-way road that comes off here and comes up along the river. And then there's a parking and a road uh, back there. So the idea would be to close those and create a, an interface between the urban um, developed areas and the river and unify that as a much more usable, friendly space. And a part of that then would entail realigning or um, redirecting the Laurel Street extension. So that would go along the base of, the, of uh, Beach Hill 
and come up this way. And I'll show you a cross section of that diagram. And I just want to note both this and other, you know, the, the entirety of the, the presentation here. These are big picture concepts, and we know that there's a lot of issues. For example, with Laurel Street Extension, there is an existing Santa Cruz County um, housing development project there. So we're trying to set out a vision that uh, can be implemented over time, but none of this is going to be, you know, it's not like it's like fait accompli or it's easy. Uh, the idea is to set out a vision for, for the entirety of the project site that can guide the future development. So this image here is showing you basically the, the circulation and streetscape. So the white areas is basically parcels that are developable. So we're trying to focus visually on what could happen, you know, along these streets and what might they look like. And this is where Matthew's come in and done some really great um, illustrations and cross sections to help us to visualize and communicate what these areas might look like. So I'm going to go through just a few of these to show some of the, the uh, kind of key cross sections. This first cross section is showing you uh, looking across, basically looking north, but a cross section all along Spruce Street. So on the left side is Pacific Avenue, and then Front Street is here, and then the river and the levees on this side. These are building forms that are associated with the scenario number three. So we're not proposing that this is you know, what's final, it's just giving you a sense of scale of how these streetscapes would work with even the most intense development under the three scenarios that we're going to talk about a little later. This is a cross section along Front Street, basically along that hillside. Um, so this is what the character of the street would look like. This is the arena, uh, basically on, on the left side here. And for context, this is Beach Hill. And one of the taller structures is uh, an old building called Gold, or Gold Building, an old house. It dates back to the 1890s Golden Gate Villa. So this just give a context of scale and how the streetscape would, would look. This cross section is showing the Laurel Street extension. So we've got um, basically a one lane road with separated uh, pedestrian path. And then you can see its relationship to the hillsides. The idea is to, to tuck the road up against that hillside. And this is a cross section looking south, I'll get my directions right, south um, along the levee. And one of the things that I didn't mention, and I wanna go back, because I failed to do that because it's gonna to relate to what you're seeing in this image. So bear with me while I go back here. One of the key concepts in this is to think about how we can unify the streetscape uh, with the, the river, uh, and excuse me, with the levee itself. So what we're thinking in the design concept here is that you could do starting at Pacific Avenue, a very moderate grade of one and a half percent. It would almost be imperceptible for people walking along Spruce Street. But what could happen is, is by the time you get out to the levee, there's no hill. So essentially we wanna meet the grade at the levee so that it reinforces and better connects the entire streetscape and, and public realm within the study area with the river levee itself. So if I go to this cross section, this is showing where this is the, the raised elevation and then how that can meet at the, at the levee itself. So the, another station, second station that we had was on beach connectivity. So as Sarah mentioned, one of the primary goals in this project um, that's been looked at for many years is how do we better connect the downtown with the beach? And essentially there's kind of, um, two ways that you can get to the beach. You can go around the hill or you can go over the hill. So this diagram shows how the context of both in blue, how you'd be going around Beach Hill and then Cliff Street is what's highlighted here in uh, green. So we saw Cliff Street as a really great opportunity because it's also the most direct connection from the study area and downtown to the beach. So the concept here is to, there's, there's a stairways that goes up to a lookout, which is a really wonderful lookout. It's got in beautiful views of the whole city of Santa Cruz and the Santa Cruz mountains, et cetera. So it's a, it's a strong nodal point, if you will, and creates an opportunity to do something special up the top there. And then to along Cliff Street is to create basically a ceremonial connection is what we're calling it between that overlook and the boardwalk. So 
we're talking about reconfiguring the parking, not removing the parking, but just creating a bit, little bit more symmetry in the parking, improving the pedestrian and bike uh, mobility along there, improving the landscaping with some sort of consistent landscaping, uh, maybe some treatments at intersections so that uh, it's safer to walk along there. And then uh, possibly once you get down closer to the beach, you could transition that in this concept, it's using palm trees to reinforce that notion of connectivity with the beach. And this is just some imagery. This is an aerial view that we took from some drone footage that's showing Cliff Street going down and you can see its axis is you know, straight just, down to the yeah, coconut right. grove. Um, this is a view down here of, of the street and you can see it's a very wide street. So it's got a lot of opportunities. Uh, we would not constrained by you know, having a narrow um, cross section there. So there's a lot of opportunities there. And then you can see some imagery on the left and right. This is the view right. from, the, from the top. Um, the next station that we communicated to, or got feedback from the public is what we called civic spaces in the arena. So the idea here is thinking about an opportunity to create a true gathering place for the community. Uh, we're, we're still getting CTV if they can quiet down a little bit or put on mute, that'd be great. Um, yeah, so, Tess, uh, hold on one second. Oh, Tess, I don't know if you have the ability to communicate with the folks at CCTV, but if you if you could do that either by phone or text or email, because um, we're still getting feedback from them uh, pretty regularly. Thank you. Sorry for the interruption, Bill, go ahead. Oh, no worries. This is the nature of Zoom. <laughs> okay, so within, this context, the, the, I'd say the primary theme here is trying to create a safe, accessible, and engaging, engaging um, space for the community, uh, for area events, and for visitors of all ages. So this is just kind of the three big takeaways, the big ideas. Um, and trying to revitalize and, and, uh, and creating a vibrant downtown. And we use the themes of art, entertainment, technology, and illumination. And I'll show a little bit about how we did that. And the other is to really connect that downtown area, excuse me, connect the downtown with the uh, beach. So this graphic is showing the concept of creating Spruce Street, and particularly where if we have the building set back far enough, and you saw that in one of the cross sections, is that you can create a really enhanced and rather large, almost two acre area from Pacific Avenue out to the levee, and then further expand that with improvements along the levee itself. So it's creating a space that can become truly a gathering space for people in the community. And when I manned this station during the open house and people really were engaged with that idea of having a place in the city where you could have maybe up to like 4,000 people could fit in this space. So it wouldn't be a small space and it would be something with you know streetscape improvements and hardscape, et cetera, to really create a, a programmed area that can basically kind of the concept of the arena and what's happening in a lot of these um, sports arenas is, is the idea of entertainment on the inside and the outside. So it's not just going into a building to watch a game or go to a concert or whatnot, but actually engaging that, that type of activity out into the public realm itself. Um, other components of this is the, the overlook that I talked about, levee trail improvements, and then the concept of uh, flex zone uh, along Pacific Avenue. So here's a cross section. Sorry, I thought I'd, I'd move that down to here. So this is a cross section. This is looking down Spruce Street between um, Pacific and Front Street out towards the river. So you can see the context of a, a very wide space and then being able to program that and change that out. For example, let's say you wanted to have a, a, a farmer's market, for example, and you could use ways of, of closing that off temporarily and then being able to use that space for other purposes than just you know, all the time for vehicles. So the concept of the Pacific Avenue flex zone. So along Pacific Avenue, um, there's ways to look at how the parking occurs on the edges of the road. And so what you're looking at is two examples. This first one is First Street in Livermore. And you'll notice that the cars are angled parking in on both sides of the street, but there's also a difference in the pavement and there's trees in between. So what essentially 
you can program this so that it can function by parking, but then it's also flexible where you can use those areas uh, in different manners to maybe it's for restaurants um, or, or events. Here's an example in Castro Street in Mountain View. So they're really, this is an outdoor dining experience where you can basically reutilize re that middle space. And this is, for example, where those trees are. So that becomes a multifunctional type of area. So the other component of this is what we're calling art and activation. And the idea here is that, you know, the, following along the lines of that inside out is how do you create a sort of a there and an entertainment district that's that's vibrant and has activity and and uh, a place to go to. So the idea of this is is that the hub is this sort of center, uh, z the zone we're calling it, and in within that center area is this area of of activated light. And it's kind of like in my describing it of thinking about it maybe as a wayfinding tool, as a similar to a neural network, if you will. In other words. That, that theme, theme of lighting and done tastefully, I'm not saying that, you know, lighten, you know, big, big lights, but you could actually use light as a wayfinding tool to connect the downtown and the, the river and cliff, or excuse me, in the beach uh, and along the river. So the, the Cliff Street connection and, um, and along the river and, and along Pacific become then these sort of spines where maybe some treatment provides a, a, a form of wayfinding to connect into this area. So these are just some imagery of thoughts. So the idea is that to use art, artistic elements in light, because uh, you know, people are sort of drawn to the light. So there's sort of this natural or, or, or metaphor of light and it can be interacted with. So what you're seeing uh, in this imagery is ways of people interacting with light features, but done in an artistic way. You can also use the buildings and sculptural, sculptural elements. You can use street furniture um, to create illumination. Uh, and then you could also use it, this is the context of the wayfinding. So these are, you know, these are more urban areas admittedly, but they provide a context for how you could think about um, how that light can extend. What you're seeing on the, uh, the left side, for instance, this is the 13th Street District in Denver. Uh, that's their clock tower. And they basically use that corridor. And at night, this is full of restaurants. And um, in fact, it's called the theater district. So it's an art and this, and you know, it's an artistic district that's connected in with activities um, to, to make it kind of more 24 seven, if you will, or at least into the evening, I should say. Uh, and that arc and activation theme doesn't just have to be light. So we can think about how during the day you're creating interesting interfaces of, for people to come to and, and inter interact with. So there's curiosity, there's youth, there's artistic, there's a lot of good, interesting components here that could create some lively, liveliness to the area. So what we're um, calling this, uh, this concept is what we're calling the zone. And we're taking the metaphor from uh, the basketball context because of the Warriors. So um, there's this idea of being in the zone or maybe even being out of your, comfort, being out of your comfort zone. And uh, you'll notice down on the right there, Thrive City. Uh, and an inspiration for this is actually our Golden State Warrior. So this is obviously at a San Francisco scale. But this is showing you what the Warriors did around their Chase Center, and they call this Thrive City. So it's basically an, the indoor outdoor. They've got a large screen up there. They've got a mix of different uses, restaurants. They've got this very interesting curving um, area for sitting that becomes an amphitheater. Um, so it's a way of thinking about how we can interface um, the, the inside of the, the future arena and the outside. And there's interesting, I read a New York Times article when the owners of the Golden State Warriors were designing this place, one of the sort of metric, metrics for success was they said that they wanna make sure that there's people coming down both when there are events and when there's not events to their area. So this is kind of a testament to for what their approach was. So with that, I'm gonna hand it back over to Sarah and she's gonna talk about the housing station. Thanks, Bill. So um, yeah, so I wanted to take a minute to um, talk through, obviously um, your commission is well aware that uh, housing is one of our um, primary concerns, both as a city and as part of this project and um, elsewhere on your agenda tonight, you're having, you're receiving the report on the, our progress uh, in the current 
cycle on our housing element, which is that, you know, that plan that every jurisdiction in the state needs to write every eight years to show that we have the capacity that we um, need to have to plan for our, um, you know, expected growth based on the growth projections that the state makes. So what I wanted to show, the point of showing this graph, um, we had this graph at the um, open house, was to just sort of give folks um, some context for what they were about to see in the development scenarios that we're um, sort of proposing or considering or thinking about collecting feedback on at this point. Um, so what's shown here in the blue, uh, the blue bars are the current cycle of RENA, which went from 2015 and goes through the end of 2023. Um, that was the obligation that the city had during that period to plan for and then also to build under certain other um, provisions of state law. What's shown in the green bars is what um, has actually been built in the city. Um, and you'll see that we are failing to meet that arena threshold in one category, the very low income category. We do have projects in the pipeline that we believe could help us meet or exceed that um, category, that requirement in that category by the end of 2023. And it's a matter of do they pull their permits, right? Do we get to count them in this cycle? So. Um, that's all you know going on and that and we're doing really well at the at the current moment in terms of meeting that like minimum obligation of the arena and what we see in these orange striped bars is the current draft the most recent draft numbers that we are getting from ambag about what we need to plan for and then make some adequate progress towards building in the next um, housing element cycle so um, as you can see there is a pretty substantial jump um, that we are facing with. These are units that we have to plan for. As we do our housing element, we have to show that we have sites where this much housing could be developed and be developed for these um, income categories, or we can't get our housing element certified, which then means we can't get grant funding. It just creates this whole domino effect of um, repercussions for the city. So um, what we have here in this project area is a significant opportunity to meet a big chunk of this arena. So um, that's what you're going to see in these development scenarios is staff and consultants thinking about, um, you know, we know that residential structures have a lifespan of typically we would expect a multifamily building to last more than 60 years up to, you know, 100. We have buildings existing now in the city that are over 100 years old. So we want to be planning for the right kind of intensity so that these buildings really make sense as the city changes over decades and decades of time. And we want to make good use of our land resources in planning this arena cycle so that we are set up for the, the next 50, 60 years of arena cycles as that you know process continues and we're going to be having to identify sites you know over time. You know, it's not we don't just meet this and then we're finished. We're going to meet this and then eight years later we're going to have another um, assignment obligation of housing of housing units to plan for. So um, we want to do this in a logical organized way. And so that as we continue to move through that process over time in the future, um, we can continue that logical organized method of um, planning for growth. So um, these these numbers aren't final yet. So um, I we sort of hesitate to you know publicize them widely. And um, you know you can read the graph. We're we're looking at close to 3,700 units that are going to be required as the total um, for for meeting this next housing element cycle. Uh, next slide, please. So um, one of the reasons that um, I want to talk about meeting our arena, so planning for it, and then also building parts of our arena is because it affects how the city is subject to SB 35, which everyone on this commission and probably mo many members of the public are familiar with because we just had our very first SB 35 application in 831 Water. So SB 35 is a state law that provides for streamlined planning review process, allows only 60 days or 90 days, depending on the size of the project, a, a streamlined review for um, multifamily housing that meets the objective standards of the jurisdiction. So currently in our current cycle, based on how much housing we've been able to build in the current housing element cycle on that previous graph, in order to qualify for that streamlined review, um, a project has to incorporate 50% of the units as affordable, which is why you know, this law has been in place for five years and we've had that one application. I think that's a really tricky 
um, way to build housing is half affordable and half market rate. Like there just really aren't very many developers that are gonna do that. So we haven't seen a ton of that at the 50% threshold. Um, and I think if we can stay at that 50% threshold, um, we probably won't see tons and tons of SB 35 applications, which sort of pull away this local discretion that we um, are accustomed to using in reviewing housing projects. And what is dependent on maintaining that 50% threshold is making adequate progress towards meeting our regional housing needs allocation, our, our housing obligation by 2020, the beginning of 2028 or the end of 2027. Um, if we, if we don't make adequate progress, then we fall to the 10% tier, which the, the county of Santa Cruz is currently in this 10% tier. And at that point, any project that includes 10% affordable housing units qualifies for SB 35. Um, well, if it's outside the coastal zone, there's some other factors, but many more would qualify just simply based on the city's inclusionary requirement, which requires 20% of all units to be affordable to low income households. Um, so SB 35 would, would start applying to many of those development proposals if we aren't making adequate progress over the next part of our housing element, the first half of our next housing element cycle. And making what adequate, the definition of adequate progress is me meeting at least half of the market rate housing allocation by the end of 2027. So um, that would require us building about twice as many housing units in the next in between 2024 and 2028, as we have built over the last seven years. So that's a that's a really big um, uptick that, you know, as staff we're thinking about, and we think as decision makers that should be part of your of the consideration is that we're looking for ways not only to plan for the housing, but to plan for housing that that actually has like a decent likelihood of getting built because um, you know, we'd like to stay at that 50% tier. I think if we can get projects that are doing 50% of their units as affordable units, um, it, it's more of a fair trade-off with the community to say they're going to go through the streamlined process and we're going to get more affordable housing off, out of it. Um, and that's just, uh, that's just less appealing when, you know, 10% is the threshold and then it's really like most standard development projects get this like streamlined review. So, that's the that's the con some of the state law context that's going into these development scenarios. So let's go on to the next slide. Oh, sustainability and resiliency. So I'm going to talk about this really briefly before we get to development scenarios. I thought they were right after this. So one of the other topics that we talked about at the open house is sustainability and resiliency. We know those are issues that are really important um, for our community. We wanted to talk about the importance of the infrastructure that runs through this area. So um, you may have noticed that we talked about uh, in these sort of like high level visionary scenarios, reclaiming some of the land that's currently occupied by the Laurel Street extension, but we didn't talk about reclaiming or building over the land um, that's currently occupied by Spruce Street. And that is primarily because Spruce Street holds some very important infrastructure for the city. So in the project area, we have the, um, the pump station, pump station one for the levee is right here at the corner, just south of Laurel Street at front. And that's really critical for the for the city's um, flood resiliency. And then there's also there are also big pipes that like help you know bring wastewater from Live Oak and bring it to Neri Lagoon for processing. So that street needs to stay accessible for maintenance and for and for access. And um, having that in this project area does provide us with this opportunity to you know upsize these pipes, like maintain this flood infrastructure sort of add more capacity in there at, should that be necessary um, or recommended as part of through the environmental impact report. So um, there are some opportunities in this area to add more resiliency features relating to specifically flood water and sea level rise that um, uh, we want to incorporate and we want to hear some feedback from your commission about you know what are the factors that are might be the most important to think about. Obviously, you know, environmental review will come through if anything, um, you know, rises up from that, that would be, you know, addressed as well. So um, sustainability and resiliency, we want to hear your thoughts, questions, concerns, ideas. Next slide. Thanks. Okay, so now we'll get to the redevelopment parcels. So um, <clears throat> as I mentioned earlier, the total project area inside that red, that red line is about 29 acres. Of that 29 acres, there are about 15 of those acres that we think have um, 
development potential, redevelopment potential, and they're highlighted, outlined in blue here. And really what this was, this sort of like identification of redevelopment potential was based on primarily two things. It was, first of all, the size of, you know, is it a dimension and an existing use that sort of allows for a parcel that could be redeveloped. And so we're looking at, you know, larger parcels are, um, have a heavier weight. And so you'll see there it's shown in a darker color here. And then um, secondly, what's the age of that existing structure that's on that parcel? Because we do know buildings have um, a limited lifespan um, and older buildings are more likely to be um, attractive for developers to um, approach and look to redevelop. So looking at about 15 acres of developable area here in this um, project area. So um, to start out, we, um, this is a map that shows the existing zoning and general plan land use designation um, for this area of the city. So um, you'll see this is coded by heights. I just want to note that the areas that are shown in pink at the 35 uh, foot height limit CBDE, those actually carry a 3.5 floor area ratio um, per the general plan. So it's likely that um, under our state law that now requires us to like allow the full capacity that's planned for in like any of your planning documents, we wouldn't be able to enforce that 35 foot height limit on a development proposal that would come in now. Um, it would probably be closer to um, like si a 60 foot height to hit that 3.5 floor area ratio that's allowed under the general plan. So just that's just context. Um, <clears throat> so and, uh, and this, the number of residential units here and the amount of commercial square footage does take that floor area ratio number into account. So that's based on, that's what those numbers are based on. So if the baseline here, the current status of this area could build about 931 um, housing units. That's not at all how many housing units there currently are there. Um, and so that, but that sort of sets the stage of like, what are we looking at in order to increase from there in, compliance with meeting our um, grant requirements to increase housing capacity. And so then for scenario one, we started by just saying like, well, what if we just bring sort of the, the existing heights that are in the downtown plan and just pull them south a little ways? Um, so you'll see we're mirror mirroring along Laurel and the, and the north part of Pacific um, on the west side, a 50 foot height limit adjacent to this uh, existing residential neighborhood. And on the east side of Pacific, we're going up to the 75 or 85 feet for the uh, enhanced height zone. Um, that's reflective of what's available to the north. And then this does include one component of a tower on block B. Um, so, right, so what this shows right now is um, that there would be a podium at 70 feet, and then there could be a tower element that would go up to 120 feet. Um, and, oh, I didn't see my slide about development agreements, but I guess maybe that comes at the end, sorry. <laughs> I haven't had a chance to like review this whole slideshow. So we'll talk more a little bit about heights and how we think we can regulate heights um, before we move into the 3D models because I know that's gonna be a sensitive issue for, for many of us. So if we just, if we essentially take what's north of Pacific and pull it south, we think we can get to just over 1300 housing units in this area. And I wanna point out in this scenario, um, we, are, we are looking at having the arena stay in its current location. So you'll see that block D shows zero housing units. Um, and that's because that's the location of the arena in this scenario. So in scenario two, we are looking at increasing height slightly and looking at moving the um, arena to that center block between Front, Front Street and Pacific Avenue so that it occupies a portion of that block. Um, so then this is starting to load the height toward the river so that we're, um, you know, sort of using these oddly shaped parcels. So there's some, there's just a reality of development that housing can sort of get fit into parcels that are sort of awkwardly shaped, but things like lots of parking, arenas, and certain types of commercial development are really much better suited to rectangular blocks. It's just much more efficient. And I'm, I'm sure you can imagine 
you know, the dimensions of an arena are pretty specific. And so there are reasons that we might, that it makes a lot of sense to put the arena on this block between Pacific and Front Street. And that is definitely one of the things that we want to hear commentary from the commission on about um, your feelings about place, the placement of the arena, how that might relate to, you know, the programming and, you know, relating to the river, being closer to the river, being further away from the river. Um, I think there are lots of considerations about where that where that um, arena is located that that will affect how it's built in terms of where do the warriors go during the construction period right so if it's being built on the site that they're currently occupying um, how are they going to manage those couple of um, seasons of play while the while the building's under construction um, and then also thinking about placing the arena here next uh, next to the river i I think we we would also want to consider how the acoustics of that might help sound travel further up and down the river channel. Um, uh, so I think there, there are just several reasons to to think that through. Um, there are, you know, thinking about a great civic space and public plaza that could be um, put in place in front of an arena. Um, and thinking about whether that belongs, you know, right on the river or, you know, a block from the river and can connect in some, you know, during like major events, but maybe not all the time. So having some separation at some times. So, you know, those are kind of some of the things we want to think about when we think about exactly where is that arena located within these development scenarios. Um, but in scenario two, um, adding some more height on block D, which is also like a pretty large block. So taking that up to that base podium of 70 feet, just like B block um, to the north, and then adding again some tower elements, this time going up to 160 feet, um, allows to us to have um, really some great views also from the tops of these buildings. You know, we got comments from a lot of people about like, um, well, some people I should say about, you know, what if we had rooftop access for the public in these places and we could have, you know, interpretation about Santa Cruz Mountains, the San Lorenzo River, the beach, um, you know, and you can really see the connection uh, to all of it from, from that height. It's a really significant opportunity. And it also just, you know, allows us to provide um, about 200 to 300 more housing units in this area by going up on these blocks and then having another 120 foot tower component on block A. Um, just south of Laurel Street. So this this scenario gets us up to um, 1579 units in the project area. Okay, and so then this is scenario three, which is our the most intense scenario that we're currently discussing and you know gathering feedback and reactions about. Um, this scenario gets us to just over 1700 units, and it does that by um, adding height primarily on block B, but then also bringing up the tower on block A to um, 160 feet rather than 120 feet. So we have um, a tower on block B that would go all the way up to 200 feet. Um, and the locations of those tower elements, of course, is, is a little bit fungible and, and could be moved around. Jason can talk about, you know, there are sort of some spacing considerations and, um, you know, maximum floor plate that you want to do with residential development to really um, make that the most efficient. But the idea of what we want to show here on the map is that it's we're not intending that the entire block would go to that height. It would just be some smaller percentage that would be um, allowed to go taller. Um, this scenario also incorporates some housing on the south end of C block. So in block C2, you're also seeing a base of 75 and a tower component up to 120. So that lets us capture some of the south end of that block for a taller building um, just south of the arena. So this one also shows the arena on block C1 um, sort of in that center location. Okay, and then I think I have one more slide. Okay. Maybe two more slides. Okay, so um, this is just sort of a summary. You have this in your packet. You have also all the backup detail in your packet, all of the um, Excel sheets that show the calculations that ran to, in order to create these models. But um, this just kind of allows you to compare them directly. So 
in scenario one, primarily I think this is based on the location of the arena, arena. We see that we have slightly less commercial square footage showing in scenario one than we do in scenarios two and three. And that has to do with the block that the arena is located on. Um, and then you can also see that we, we're just, you know, our base floor area is climbing through um, all of these scenarios. And um, and that goes along with, of course, the unit count um, in each in each case. And then we, we broke out parcels A to D, A through D, because that's those are the four that really have the highest um, potential for redevelopment. Those are the sites with the, the um, oldest buildings and they're the largest box. So just those are the places that it's going to be most appealing for a developer to pursue redevelopment. Okay. Okay, so height and density controls. I did want to just take a minute because these are more intense heights than we have seen before in Santa Cruz. And so um, it would not surprise me that some people might be a little um, you know, apprehensive or have some concerns about that. So I just want to talk, talk through a little bit how we've been thinking about these heights as we're sort of, you know, putting these initial scenarios together. So the first thing is that our currently in the city, every because of our inclusionary requirement, which requires 20% of the housing units be affordable to a low income household, all developments are entitled qualify for a density bonus, which would allow them to um, add units, waive site standards and seek concessions. So sometimes a project development will seek waivers or concessions without adding any units. Um, sometimes developers will want to pursue certain specific waivers in a, in in and while adding units and not others. And there's really just a whole mix of, of the different ways that um, a density bonus could be um, could be applied um, on a given site. And it's it's really hard to model that directly and specifically because there are so many variables that go into it. So the way that we've been kind of thinking about these heights, and we are you know, still accepting feedback on this, of course, um, is that the heights that we're showing here could be capped through a developer's agreement. So a developer's agreement is an agreement between the city and a private developer that in exchange for providing some public benefit to the city and the community that the developer gets um some some extra entitlement so and typically it's more density more units more height or or less parking or less open space so that kind of those are the the range of things that allow that development envelope to be a little bit bigger to fit more units and make it a, a more profitable project for the developer um, and we could do that if you know we're getting a public benefit out of it so we've been considering that could be one tool we could use in this plan and we could have sort of two paths in written into the downtown plan and we can say you know if you do a developer agreement to provide you know x y and z public benefit um, or anything in this list of benefits then you can get these heights that we're showing in the scenarios um, and if you're unwilling to do a development agreement then you have a lower base height because we're going to assume that you're going to be pursuing a density bonus right and so um because we're doing a specific plan, I think we have the opportunity to really like lay that out. Um, so that's kind of how we're thinking about these scenarios at this point. Um, yeah, so that's, oh, sorry, I covered all my points on that slide. And so now at this point, I am gonna hand it off to Justin Duell of Dahlin, um, who did all of the modeling for the these scenarios. And he's gonna talk us through um, sort of what they show and um, why we sort of made some of the initial choices we did. And of course, we're here to get your feedback on all of it. So Justin, are you there? I'm here. Thank you, Sarah. Yeah, and thank you, Bill. Thank you both. Um, and thank you to the commission for your time tonight. Um, <clears throat> so I, I think um, we have we have four view angles here to kind of walk you guys through. And it sounds like you, you've seen, I'm not sure how in depth you've gone into the spreadsheets that have all the numbers that that back this up, but this is um, th through all through a, through a series of assumptions um, and and kind of uh, typical development practices. We've we've put these together as um, visual representations of what those spreadsheets and the summary tables are are conveying. So our our, our first view here is um, from the south. Uh, it's kind of a bird's eye view taken from above Beach Hill, um, and it and it kind of helps to put all the scenarios in in the context of what's around them. 
And, um, and so I think we have kind of four significant context um, scenarios. We have the, of course, the, the existing downtown area to the north, uh, the, the, the river um, to the east, we have Beach Hill to the south, and then we have the um, neighborhood conservation area um, immediately adjacent to the west. And, and as Sarah was mentioning, the areas that are currently um, would, would be governed, we believe, by the, the FAR and the general plan for the CBD um, uh, designation actually shows that the, the tallest heights in the baseline scenario occurring immediately adjacent to that conservation, uh, neighborhood conservation area. So um, in, in terms of kind of how the, 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 the density gradient of the existing downtown plan area that we're, we're extending to the south works, that, that's kind of, um, it's kind of at odds, kind of the inverse of, of what that um, what what that shows. So as, as we move from um, the baseline scenario to scenario one, um, in that in that block, you can actually see those those blocks drop by a couple of stories. A three point five on on that sort of a block scale, we think is probably going to occur at a, at a five to six story. Um, we've moved this back into a fifty foot height zone in scenario one, um, and and the the bulk of the density now is occurring in in the four blocks um, A through D. Um, with some slightly taller height on Block B, which is the one closest to the river um, and the Laurel Street Bridge. Um, so um, let's see, as we move in from here into scenario two, we'll see the arena move in, more into the center of the plan. And that's as, as we're increasing height and, and density, we want to we want to kind of continue to emphasize that gradient, um, you know, respecting the neighbors. It's bringing a little more height a, a, against the river edge um, because there are, our residentials now become taller than what the arena envelope would be. Um, they're also phasing considerations uh, for the arena that, that would factor into that. Um, and then uh, the difference between scenario two and scenario three um, is, is, is a, kind of marginal at this point. Once we've gone to a, a, a base height of 85 feet everywhere and a few select tower locations, um, we, we can see we're just we're really just stacking a few extra floors on top. Of that, so um, if we if we move into the next view angle, it's from this would be from a, across the river, um, and we're looking we're looking back toward um, the arena on the sort of the left there, snugged up against Beach Hill, um, and that's in the existing uh, existing arena's location. Uh, one thing I think it's interesting to note here is how the um, the adjacent landform of Beach Hill and the development that's on top of that that's only you know in the in a one to two story range um, actually is, is approximately the same level as, as what comes out in, in our plan area down um, several stories lower, um, kind of creates a, a very similar um, skyline at this scenario. And as you can see, we've modeled some of the, um, the buildings that are still in the pipeline or under construction um, north of Laurel. Um, and, it's, and there's really, um, it's a pretty consistent, what you would call a, a base height for that, um, for, for a base density. Um, Could you go back so, a slide, please, and show you scenario three for a second? Thank you. That's that's fine. Um, so we'll move we'll move through the same set of scenarios here, and you can kind of see how that um, how that how that gradient changes um, again as we move from from the baseline to scenario one. That um, the arena is in the same location. That that sort of base plinth height of, of density is about the same, and there's only a, a single area in Block B where we we brought the height up a little bit. Um, scenario two, and then scenario three, push that arena back, and they pull more height um, out toward the river. And again, all that the, the the highest intensity there is all in the in the foreground to us, and it's it's um, it's done really to to respect the the context and um, the neighborhood conservation area. Um, largely, and then then the the difference between scenario two and scenario three um, is is again just a, a, a few floors there stacking on top. Um, so the third view is um, above the roundabout uh, adjacent to Depot Park, and it's looking um, back to the northeast along Pacific. Um, in in the baseline scenario, those are uh, existing residential districts are are. Um, I think 35, 36 foot height limit. Um, just behind uh, the first set of buildings, you, you can see the, um, the proposed project there that despite that height limit has used a density bonus and gone up, I think to 75 or 85 feet. 
Um, and, and and so that there's that that kind of highlights the um, you know what the expectation is um, given state law um, that that in, unless you get some some kind of controls in place and some kind of um, assurances as much as you can, it, there, there's not a lot you can do to to prevent that. Um, so I, I think that that kind of illustrates one of those cases right there. Um, as as we move into the the first um, scenario. Uh, the the development in the foreground um, is is we we've raised the height limit to to 75 feet here, um, and so it's starting it's now reflecting that kind of same um, height and grain of architecture and and you don't you're really not seeing anything come above um, that base height again yet in in scenario two um, the the taller height is introduced and and again it's you know it's it's away from um, from this edge where we're, where we're breaking into the um, kind of the tower um, scenario. And you can see from this angle um, some of the tower separation. And so we've discussed a number of things along the way about, um, you know, tower, as you go into what we call a quote unquote tower floor plate, um, the controls, things like um, proportion of length to width, um, you know, per percentage of the block that is allowed to go up to a certain height and, and um, minimum spacing between, um, portions of the building that, that exceed a certain base height, um, all, all designed to really to, to prevent um, what we sometimes refer to as slab towers, um, as opposed to point towers and, and um, you know, kind of massive density as opposed to, to slender density or some, some of the terms that we use. Um, so we have a number of different things, you know, when we go to these heights that we like to, uh, we like to use to, to um, you know, do the best that we can to, to think of this from a form perspective um, and and control the impact of, of the density um, scenario three then as we go on is um, still still allowing for some of that separation you're seeing some towers in the foreground and some um, in the background there but they're all they're all held back um, you know it, again in in the um, in the spirit of the existing downtown plan to, um, to to taper down from from the downtown edge and the river edge um, toward the adjacent neighborhoods uh, so the final view we have is this is um, on the left side of the screen. That's um, that's Laurel Street um, down to the Laurel Street Bridge. Uh, on the very very right hand side, you can see, and we we don't have the trees, the the trees that are really there would block it, but the the Dream Inn uh, is back back there in the distance, just to kind of um, give you a little bit of context. Um, baseline scenario again, you can actually kind of see um, along uh, kind of the the the. Um, Pacific and, and Laurel Edge, where we have that um, general plan driven FAR density, kind of the tallest heights at about six floors. And we move into scenario one, we see that drop and the density behind it start to rise, which um, contextually is a, is, a, is a nice, nice move. Um, the scenario two, uh, we again, we see those towers start to um, come up out of that, that base height. Um, Next slide, please. As we go, and and from this angle, you can really see how some of those controls of, of separation and um, and proportion can can control that. You know, it, it is most certainly not an entire block um, being built up to those heights when we talk about the flex zones, and um, the idea of which is that they're they're located within a certain set of parameters within the block, um, not necessarily controlling precisely where they go. They can they have the ability to to flex within each block subject to the other controls um, that we're talking about. And then lastly, scenario three, the, the, the height increases a little bit, but the separation all stays the same. Um, and, and so it's really, you know, similar to, to some other kind of, um, you know, cities who have implemented uh, urban design aspects and controls. Uh, you know, it's, it's, the idea is kind of about creating a little bit of a, somewhat of a hill form out of the, the skyline um, Things that 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 step and have a, a general density gradient that kind of makes sense, um, and um, and, I, and you know I, I think we've we've opened up some possibilities for actually real kind of landmark um, signature buildings um, that would that would anchor this um, this district we're calling the zone for now. So I, I think that's it um, from my standpoint, and I, th I think we'll go back maybe to Sarah for the for the summary. I was ready for Bill to do this one. Bill, were you ready for me to do this one? <laughs> uh, 
Either way, I'll, I'll just give it back on, then I'll pass it over to you. Um, so as I said before, we had 190 comments and 150 people showed up, so we got a lot of good um, doc, uh, feedback. So this is just a summary of, of what we heard. Overall, very positive support for the design concepts and the opportunity to create an entertainment district that's vibrant, walkable, and safe. So people are excited about kind of creating a there and the idea of that plaza and a, and a community meeting space for, you know, New Year's Eve event or um, holiday lighting or um, the Halloween events and, you know, whatever types of events you can imagine. But um, in fact, one of the one of the people said, wouldn't it be great you could have some sort of event down there with food trucks and they relate to the, to the river and just really creating an interesting space along Spruce Street. So a lot of good uh, feedback in that context of the community's desire to have that type of, of um, amenity in their downtown and for the community in the region, really. Uh, strong support for more housing. That was a very consistent theme. Strong support for the Warriors and construction of a permanent arena. Um, and some of the issues that uh, for further consideration, parking and traffic congestion, particularly uh, during the summer months and, you know, what happens down at the beach, but just getting through downtown and uh, dealing with parking, et cetera. Um, support for, and, and opportunities for local businesses. And then lastly, varied options regarding uh, development scenarios. So I can't say that it was like a, you know, there certainly was a broad spectrum. There was many people saying development or scenario three is, you know, more of it, bring it on. Um, some were like, well, maybe we don't need that much height. Um, but it certainly wasn't uh, adamant opinions. I'd say it was a broad spectrum and, and everyone was super supportive. I'd say the whole thing was, it was a constructive open house session where they were being heard and um, a lot of great feedback was received as a result of the, the format. Mm -hmm. Great. So I'll hand it over to you, Sarah. Okay, thanks. <laughs> okay, so um, we have you know, spent about an hour here walking you through a ton of information. And um, so there are lots of, you know, we're obviously we can talk about whatever you want to talk about. And um, there are a few things that it would be the most helpful to us. And as we move to, you know, from where we are now towards like getting to a preferred scenario or preferred options, you know, because we might want to consider different options for the roadway realignment or the arena location. Um, these are the areas that it would be the most helpful to us to sort of focus the discussion, um, circulation and realignments. I know there's probably a, some thoughts on that. Um, beach connectivity via Cliff Street, any any ideas or concerns or issues or, you know, I, thoughts you have on that. Um, obviously, building heights are going to be a topic of conversation and the range of housing units. It would be really helpful if we could get to... Um, Kind of narrow down a range of housing units that your commission um, is interested in seeing and is interested in staff pursuing from here. We are going to be talking to the downtown commission as well next week, um, getting feedback from them. And I expect that their feedback is going to be um, a little broader. You know, the, they are business owners, they manage the parking district, so they're going to be focusing on kind of different things. And you all, as the planning commission, obviously, the land use is, you know, um, what's here in your wheel house to advise the city council about. So um, any specificity that we can get around the range of housing units that we want to study in the um, EIR would be real helpful. Uh, opinions about the arena location. I'm interested if there are, you know, if we want to study options or if we want to settle on one at this point. Um, and then of course, any ideas or thoughts you have about civic spaces, either, you know, programming, uh, alignment, location, um, all of that. Um, and so then I think that's our last slide. And then we we're, we're available for any questions um, that your commission may have at this point. Okay, hey, thank you so much, uh, Sarah and the consultant team for that presentation. Okay, what I'd like to do now is open it up to the commissioners for a clarifying question. As Sarah pointed out, there was a lot of information there. And I want to try to have all of us, and I'm reminding myself that this is just the time that we'll go for clarifying questions before we launch into the broader discussion and provider feedback. So if, if any commissioners have um, questions, I have a couple, um, uh, go ahead and raise your hand and we can get staff to kind 
kind of clarify any of the information you heard. Well, I'll go ahead and start, and then if anybody else has a, I, I was wondering, Sarah, um, uh, I see Commissioner Mercedes Miller, so just go ahead and raise your hand and we'll just bounce it around for clarifying questions. Um, I think this might be for staff, but how, how many residents currently live in residential housing in the expansion area? That's a great question. Um, thank you for that. So I actually, I have pulled that number. I want to say it's between 200 and 300. I don't okay. have the exact number in front of me, unfortunately, but yeah, it's in that range. Okay. And just like a broader question, I think, I think we're at about the, the total population of Santa Cruz now is about 64,000. It's a little more that than right? that. Um, okay. But yes. Okay. Okay, I mean, I'm just trying to get some context for the outreach efforts. And, and what was the timing for the outreach? Was it, I couldn't, if it was in the packet, I must have missed it. Was it like a three, four month thing? From the um, time for the, the initial, for our, for our first um, outreach in the fall, you mean? Yeah, so there was the, the online portion, there was the open house, there was a couple other elements. What was the length of time for that kind of, uh, engagement sure. on the outreach strategy. Yeah, so um, so our first meeting that we had was back in October, um, and you know we publicized that through all of our standard city channels. The Warriors also um, reached out to you know their mailing list to help publicize that. So, um, and we had you know I would say between twenty and thirty folks attend that first initial um, online workshop, and then um, all of that content was put on our website and that was available for four weeks on our through our project website for more folks to weigh in and we did more outreach through our social media channels and um so the, the down, we reached out to the downtown business association and some other folks that have um reached downtown other community organizations that are um, operating downtown shared with their um mailing lists um, so, and then we, so we gathered feedback um, for the, from the survey for four or five weeks. And then we closed the survey. We left the ideas walls up for a little while and then closed those again before the holidays. And so we could kind of gather all of that um, feedback together and then spend, you know, January through the beginning of April working on having that feedback inform these development scenarios. Um, and then for the open house that we had, we sent um, direct mailers to anyone within 500 foot radius of the project area or within the project area. And then also did outreach through all of our, you know, city social media channels, posting on the city website. Um, and again, the Warriors, I think, reached out to their mailing list as well. So, um, and we are, this information from the website, I just want to acknowledge this is not on, or if from the open house is not on our website yet. I had really hoped to have it up there by now, but um, we are going to have it up by Tuesday of next week. We're going to have this PowerPoint up and we're going to also have the PDFs of all the documents that were at the open house so that we can open up that online comment forum for a few weeks um, before we are heading to city council with comments. So, um, so that's, yeah, is that kind of answer your question? Yeah, I mean, I just want to get kind of a um, that the the time the public could actually interact and provide feedback. It was like over all those different components, it was two to three months where they they could actively provide feedback for you. Is that about right? I would say it will be two months by the time we, after we open the online, cause it's not on, it's not available online yet. I don't want to pretend it has been. So um, okay. we'll have it up for three weeks now, um, starting early next week. So yeah, it'll, it'll hit a right around the two month mark. Okay. So, so at this point, the community has only had about a month or month and a half to actually provide feedback for this. That's Sure. Yeah. I mean, I would say that's pretty typical of a planning process. You know, we have community workshops, we collect feedback, you know, offering this stuff online now is, you know, something we've started doing in the last few years and does allow a few more weeks for folks who can't make it to those in-person events to, um, you know, read about it, provide comment, get involved. Yeah. Great. Okay. Thanks. Um, I think I saw Commissioner Misidi Miller, then uh, Commissioner Kennedy, and then Commissioner Greenberg. Go ahead, Commissioner Misidi Miller. Thank you for that presentation. Really um, great job. I really uh, appreciate the 
clarity with which you explain some complex things. So thank you, uh, really great job. I, just a few questions. Um, one is about the arena numbers. Um, mm -hmm. I, there was some conversation um, about the consequences of failing to meet our arena numbers. Um, I'm not sure I fully understood it. I'm wondering if it would be um, too much to, you know, like, is there a summary way to think about it that uh, if we fail to meet our arena numbers, then one, two, three things happen, you know? Yeah, okay, sure. I'll, I'll see if I can I can do that. I might ask Matt Van Wa to um, support. Um, so first of all, there's two components of this arena. So that's the, uh, you know, for anyone who is not familiar with that, um, acronym that's the regional housing needs allocation that is the obligation the city has for housing over an eight-year period of time so there are two parts of that obligation the first and this is the the piece that we have had for decades is the obligation to plan for capacity that for that many housing units that that many housing units can get built and that they can get built um, for the lower income components that they can get built at the right density to qualify under the state's um, determination of, you know, equating density to affordability, which we know in California is like kind of um, challenging argument to justify and that's the way that the state law is written. Um, so we have an obligation to plan for RENA. If we don't plan enough housing, if we don't identify enough sites to meet our RENA, that state will not certify our housing element of our general plan. If we don't have a certified housing element, there are lots of state funding mechanisms that the city is not eligible for. That includes transportation funding. It obviously includes, um, I, I think it also includes affordable housing funding. Um, and there are probably other things. I'm not a, a complete expert on that. Um, and that's not something we intend to find out about. <laughs> Um, we intend to plan for the obligation that we've been, um, that we will be assigned. Again, these numbers aren't final yet, and we have no reason to believe they're going to shift very much before from the current draft. So um, the other piece is, do we actually build enough to meet that obligation? Do we make adequate progress? And that is not something that the city completely controls because that relies on private developers. It relies on the cost of land, the cost of lumber, the cost of labor, right? We don't control those things. Um, it relies on are there developers even working in the area? Are there enough construction workers? All of the things, right? All of that stuff. Um, making adequate progress means, you know, ma making like proportional progress towards those goals. And they check in um, once in the middle of the housing element cycle and once at the end of the housing element cycle to see if you're making adequate progress. And um, if you are making adequate progress in, um, in your market rate housing at that check-in, then you are, then you land at least into the tier of SB 35 that's requires that developments be, um, 50% affordable. So you're, you're in sort of a more, a higher, what am I trying to say? It's a higher level of, um, challenge that a developer faces to get a SB 35 application. If we're meeting, if we're building enough um, of market rate housing, then SB 35 applications are limited to 50% at, um, affordable projects. That's the tier we're in now. If we're not making adequate progress on meeting that market rate housing, then we are in a 10% tier, which means any project that provides 10% of the housing for low income households is eligible for that SB, SB 35 streamlining. And again, I say okay. any project not in the coastal zone has to be, you know, existing urban development. There are a couple of qualifiers and we would see many more of those those types of applications which are extremely streamlined um, and exempt from CEQA. So, um, it, and if we can meet our entire arena, if we're making adequate progress in every income category, then we are not subject to SB 35. And that would be amazing. We actually are on track if we can get our very low income units that are in the pipeline, if we can get them to pull building permits by the end of next year, we'll be in that position for the first four years of our um, next housing element cycle, which would be um, refreshing at least for staff, right? Um, processing all these applications. And, um, you know, I, I think hitting that adequate progress milestone is, uh, is a challenge and it's, 
you know, um, I think we're going to be in a different place in the end of 2027. We'll just, we'll have to see how far we can get. That was a lot of words. Did I answer your question? Yeah, no, that, that, I think that, that, that explained it really well. Thank you so much. Okay. I'm a little bit confused about the ramifications of failing to meet the number I kind of understood, but the progress is a little bit fuzzy for me. So thank you sure. for clarifying. Really, really good job. A couple other questions. Uh, oh, Commissioner? Uh, sorry, sorry to interrupt. I just wanted to add one thing to, to Sarah's comments as well. Oh, sure, go ahead. Uh, just in, in relation to planning for those units through that housing element process, those RENA units that we're going to be receiving, uh, the, the city has to adequately show uh, where those units uh, can be built. Uh, if, if it can't do that, uh, the housing element process would include a rezoning where we'd actually have to show that we're gonna rezone properties to allow that additional capacity. So the big thing we're thinking here is, you know, not just for this next arena cycle, but even for future ones as well, you know, the more housing units we can add to this area now, the less rezoning we have to do elsewhere in the city, uh, potentially not any. Uh, and, you know, given the contentiousness of other areas and, uh, you know, people, you know, having more housing closer to neighborhoods and things like that, you know, this just seems like an area that's uh, ideal for for more units than other places. Thank you. Kind of that's kind of just ties right into my next question, which you may have just answered. But let me let me just repeat it so that I make sure I get it answered. Uh, if if we don't plan for the housing units in our downtown in this project area, downtown project area, what then happens to other areas of the city? So we we still let's just say we'll pick the thirty seven hundred unit uh, number because. That's what we have to work with. And so I'm just gonna pick a number here, you know, 1,700 units we find in downtown, we still have to plan for 2,000 units somewhere else in the city. Is that right? Well, uh, yeah, so, so we would start the first step of the housing element um, is to sort of analyze what's the existing capacity in our general plan and under our zoning code, um, because we do have some existing capacity, right? right. So we've built right. a lot of housing. Our general plan has a lot more capacity, right? Like, so we can count all the sites on the corridors that don't have entitlements. We can count those towards, you know, showing we have adequate sites, right? So that's when, when Matt says, you know, potentially not any, if, you know, if we can, it, there's a, there is a, you know, a universe in which we can plan for enough housing in this project area that for this housing element cycle, we have enough capacity elsewhere in our general plan between this project and then, you know, the other existing capacity, right? And so then in this cycle, we wouldn't be in a position of needing to rezone. And it's just that I think we're close to that, you know, that edge of like, are we going to have to find a little bit more to rezone or not? And um, unfortunately, you know, just the timing of the housing element is that, you know, that's starting in several more months to like really dig in and do that full analysis of what's the remaining capacity in our general plan. Great. Okay. Thanks. Um, a couple of the questions, the, um, I really like the idea of the, uh, the overlook, you know, at the top of Cliff Street. Um, I thought that was a really uh, attractive feature of the plan. And I'm wondering, um, it didn't appear that uh, that was selected as a viewpoint for the different scenarios, hmm. uh, or, or did I miss something, or, or no. was it? Yeah, no, we didn't model that directly. That would have been, see, we should have talked to you first. That would have been, um, yeah, interesting to do. <laughs> yeah, maybe if I can just explain. Um, yes, please. It's, it's a little hard to see the, because of the way the vegetation is and, and the hillside. Um, you can you can kind of get a peak of view view down to the river, but you can't really see more to the left, if you will. So, oh no, I, I I know the spot. I you know I've yeah. been there. I, I, I'm intrigued but, by yeah. by that. But, and we know. certainly can do a, a view from there. I just was I'm just thinking like when I remember being up there, it, it's a little hard to see all the way around, if you will. But it is certainly we could it do is. a simulation view. So, it is it is yeah. hard to see all the way around, but you know, those views uh, that have vegetation in the in the way can be modified. You know. Absolutely, yep. Um, so I'm wondering, um, so that's not a view that was represented and I'm, I would love to see that view. So if, you know, before the public sees it online or whatever, it might be useful to um, have at least a view looking north, you know, back towards downtown from, from there. Um, okay, so I, I didn't miss anything and that might be something we can see in the future. Um, 
shading effects. I'm, I'm wondering uh, when you thought about these buildings at you know 160 feet, 200 feet, whatever. Um, was there any shading studies done, uh, and 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 were those uh, well? For, were, were they done? No, those, we haven't done those yet. No. Okay. Is that is that something that gets done at some point in time, or I mean, I assume we'll do that as part of the environmental impact report. Yeah. So um, I'm actually not sure if shade is a sequel issue. Bill, do you have any insight on that? Are you talking to me? I'm thinking. No. I was I was gonna ask Bill or yeah. Lee to weigh in on whether shading shade is a sequel issue. Hi, good afternoon or evening, Commissioners Lee Butler, Director of Planning and Community Development, and um, different cities handle that different ways. And um, I can uh, check and see while we're talking here and confirm the approach that we take. But I know that oftentimes the shade is only a significant impact if it is. Um, related to shading a public park, for example. Um, and um, that's the only, I'm trying to think back through the projects that I've dealt with, and, and that's the only instance where I've seen shade as a, a significant impact. Um, Eric is on the line here. He may know um, how we, uh, what our threshold of significance is. Yeah, Eric Marlatt, um, shading isn't, hasn't been a CEQA issue with us um, here. We, we do have some um, very, very vague uh, general policies on design permits regarding shading, um, but they're not objective, so they're, they're difficult to enforce, but not a CEQA issue. Okay. Um, and then I just wanted last... to add to uh, just as far as shading impacts go, you know, shade generally, uh, the largest impact is to the to the north of those properties from the south sun, uh, which in this case would all be the downtown area, which is all north and in these these areas. And then also the idea behind doing these more narrow tower elements really, really narrows the amount of shade or shortens the amount of shade time, uh, you know, with the passing sun uh, versus uh, like a, a wider squat building. Uh, so that that's another thing to consider as well. Thanks, sir. Um, last question. Um, on Front Street, um, I like the idea of having Spruce Street gradually slope up to the top of the levee. Uh, I'm curious, and I, and I appreciated, you know, offering us a profile that illustrated that, but I'm also curious about what happens on Front Street as you go down Front Street over uh, newly raised Spruce Street. I, mean, I don't know what the elevation, how much higher than Front Street it would be now. Um, but what would happen to Front Street as you go up over a raised Spruce Street and then back down to Front Street? I'm just wondering if there was a profile cut along front that would illustrate that. Um, yeah, so um, Matt Thompson might weigh in on this um, drawing since he drew that profile. And um, I think this that that alignment that we showed of like basically a flat transition to the levee does assume that there's sort of like wholesale redevelopment on a bunch of these parcels so that that whole road is like, so you're not just hitting a bump going over Spruce Street, right? So that more of the road is reconstructed and raised up to meet it. Nathan, it looks like you have something you want to add. Sure. Yeah, Nathan Nguyen, uh, City Engineer, City of Santa Cruz. Uh, yeah, you bring up a great point, uh, Commissioner uh, the City of there. The slope that's being proposed right now, I believe is less than 5%. So from Pacific Avenue up to the levee elevation grade would be uh, again, less than 5%. Um, and then the roadway itself on Front Street would have to slope up. Um, you know, if you're going northbound on Front, you'd, you'd have to climb up to the intersection of Front and Spruce, and then it would go back down to meet the existing elevation of Lowell Street. So yeah, you, you, that's a good catch. Okay, thank you. So that so somebody did think about that, and uh, there would be a rise to the Spruce Street intersection. Um, great. Those were my questions. Thank you. All right, uh, kicking it over to Commissioner Kennedy and Commissioner Greenberg. You're on deck. Oh, this is so exciting to see this all coming together down here with all the work that's gone into downtown. Um, so I have three questions. On the arena location, I know in the past there's been discussions involving the Civic 
and like some attempts to talk to Seaside Company about this, but is there any, what's the updated status on any of those ideas for the arena? And are they, is it possible or is this the spot? Um, I'm not sure I understand what you mean. There have been taught, there's been conversation about moving the arena to the, where the Civic is? So like 10 years ago, there were okay. some thoughts about a combo thing. Like when we were talking about the original Warriors Dome. I see, okay. But so maybe that's I, not yeah. considered. So that mm -hmm. kind of predates my tenure with the city. Um, at this point, we're not talking about that. We're talking okay. we're talking about looking for a site within this project area. Um, and really based on the geometry uh, that's necessary for an arena, there's really two locations. Okay. So they can stay where they are or they can go to um, that more center block. And so has there ever been interest or discussions with the Seaside Company on their big parking lots? At the beach? Yeah, right, right across the boardwalk. Wouldn't that be a great spot for an arena? Wait, I don't know. Okay, sorry, I have not I'll get had back to our, our project area here. Um, yeah. Okay. That's. I mean, that's an interesting idea. I, I'll, I'll be honest. I, we have not discussed that. We've been looking within this project area. Okay, this is me trying to reconstruct these old memories more than uh, challenge your great work here, Sarah. So, um, one second, it, it for a second, I saw uh, Catherine Johnson's hand. Did you have something you wanted to add, Catherine? Sorry to interrupt. Oh, yes, yes I, I just want to. I just wanted to say that uh, there had been uh, the idea that um, something might be done with the. Um, auditorium and the civic auditorium and there were some studies done and it was basically um, going to be more expensive than and not very successful um, it, it just it it wasn't going to pan out and that was probably I don't know between five and ten years ago okay thanks uh, yeah, it's coming back to me it, this it's not there's not enough room there if I remember right okay. exactly so my second question, and I worked a lot on the, the downtown plan extension, and one of my kind of ongoing concerns with all the good work we did on that plan and moving down into this area is that levy area and the new land we create is just so sensitive in terms of the environment and people living there and all the, the issues we see by the river walk. So my question is, I think we'd, well, before I ask the question, we do a pretty good job kind of unifying all that, but has there ever been a thought of like a unified river plan for the levy, you know, to just bring all those parts together? I see each area plan doing it separately, but has that ever been thrown out there or thought about, or is there a grant we can go get for that? We do have um, a San Lorenzo, the Slurp San Lorenzo Urban oh. River Plan um, that, and actually that's, I should mention that's another component of you know the this area is that you know there are some policies I, I mean and i'm not super familiar with the slurp right now but my sense is that it's pretty high level and it's really focused on um environmental resources maybe eric knows actually yeah. or lee um so there is a plan that addresses the river um and you're right it's not like the strongest the area plans seem to govern in terms of land development and so each one of them sort of like tries to address this in their own way. Um, yeah, that's what we have now. Okay. My intent with that is just that these spaces become awesome civic spaces. And mm -hmm. um, my, well, I'll, I, I, I'll get to the discussion later. Okay, so my last question um, has to do with energy use. And I really, you know, like generally am in favor of big buildings and housing. Mm -hmm. And I know when you kick up to a tower that's mainly steel and glass, mm -hmm. it becomes a whole different scenario for energy use. So mm -hmm. I understand this is planning and not the energy code or building, right. but I would like to ask if anyone has analyzed or thought about district-wide energy solutions for a, a plan area like this. Mm -hmm. And the example I'd like to cite is, you know, the Salesforce Tower in San Francisco, the huge one, it's an office building. It, it has an effective R value of the envelope of three. So it's basically as thermally efficient as an old 
16, you know, like Middle Ages stone building. Yeah. So that building is a huge radiator to just like burn energy and put it out in, yeah. in, into the atmosphere. And so I think it's worth thinking about district energy on a, on a project area like this. And perhaps that's something that could be incentivized down the road with one of those developer agreements, you know. There's a lot of stuff happening in this field, and I just want to put it on the table and say it's a big concern of mine. Yeah, okay. Well, let's discuss that more when we get to discussion, because I do think that's um, really, I mean, now's the time to bring that kind of thing up. Matt, did you have something you wanted to add? Yeah, just in terms of your comments on uh, steel, Commissioner, uh, cross-laminated timber is something that's going to be added to the California Building Code in this coming update which really allows wood construction buildings to go much higher, even as high as like 18 stories. Uh, and it's it's even higher in you know other places around the world, but that's what it would be in California. Uh, so that's something we're also seeing, you know, in terms of being able to build, you know, more green and higher than the seven, eight stories that's able to right now under wood construction. Great point, Matt, thank you. You sequester some carbon doing that too. Okay, let's go ahead and move to um, Commissioner Greenberg. And before I go to Commissioner Greenberg, I just want to say that um, um, my intent is also to allow the public to comment, even though this isn't an action item. And I just want to, for the folks who have hung in there this long, keep on hanging in there. We'll we'll get to you in a second. Go ahead, Commissioner Greenberg. Okay, thanks. Um, uh, Commissioner Dawson, and thank you so much to uh, the planning staff um, and Sarah Noisy and everyone for an amazing and very inspiring and exciting plan. Um, and uh, I'm wondering about whether there's been consideration about the impact that this new development around a big arena and all the investment that's going in and all the new housing that's going in um, the impact on raising land values and gentrification and displacement um, in the surrounding areas mm -hmm. adjacent to the downtown, um, as well as potentially even within the the, the planned area mm -hmm. and any thinking that's going on about displacement. Yes. Yeah, for sure. That's a really important issue. So thank you for bringing that up. I hope we'll discuss it more when we get to the discussion session section. So um, at this point, the um, the thinking has been that, you know, this is an issue that we're going to have to address and think about. So we're also operating um, under a couple of assumptions. So the first assumption being that, you know, California state law continues to require um, relocation of existing te tenants and replacement of any existing housing that is occupied by a lower income household with a first right of return. At, into a, an equivalent unit. So any direct displacement would have to be sort of um, mm -hmm. accommodated under state law and replaced, right. yep. you know, with, with those tenant services. So yep. we're operating under that assumption. And we are also currently at this point operating under the assumption that the city's inclusionary requirement would apply at 20% in this area. And that's where we've started at, in terms of making our baseline assumptions. Um, and that is a place where we expect to have more comment and feedback from the commission, from the public, from the city council. Okay, um, and I, I have some some more thoughts on that. Um, and so, yeah, there's the, the distinction between direct and indirect displacement. So, um, right. so in terms of indirect displacement, at this point, we have not spent a lot of time um, thinking about how we could address that. And um, I think it's a really good point. Okay, thanks. And uh, and related to Rena, actually, I'm just wondering um, the degree to which preservation of existing affordable housing is ever considered, perhaps not, because they want to increase and or conversion of market rate housing to affordable housing? So I actually, I think I will let Catherine answer that when she does her presentation, because I know there are specific ways that they talk about, um, you know, rehab units counting, you can count in the arena and mm -hmm. um, certain units that you like preserve in specific ways can count, but I don't think it's like a blanket across the board. Catherine, do you wanna um, mm -hmm. share something now? Yeah. Yeah, I can I can address that. It, Sarah's exactly right. There there are methods that you can use to um, allow preserved units to count towards your arena, but it's a little bit it's a little draconian the the process of doing that, and um, 
we have not done it in the past, um, partially because although our housing department works really well um, with the developer or the property owners to get those to continue the, those agreements, often they're on a relatively short term, like a, a five year um, term. And so every five years they go through another agreement and it's not, mm. um, I, I, I don't remember the number off the top of my head, but um, HCD wants a longer term than that before they will count it as an affordable unit. Oh, I see. So it would have to be to, you know, to something that's like deed restricted, like a conversion. It, yeah. Have mm -hmm. to be, um, or, or the term, I mean, it wouldn't necessarily, if they were a dev developer agreement, it might be allowed, but it would have to be like a 55 year term. Mm -hmm. And usually with these rehab, they're just not that long term. Mm. Okay. So, um, thanks and interested in just, uh, thank you for that. Um, and interested in questions of preservation and, um, uh, and you know, preventing um, displacement and so forth in surrounding areas, and perhaps other ways of building up our arena in the broader in the broader area. So, thanks. Okay. Um, again, members of the public, we're almost there. One more commissioner here, Commissioner Schifrin. Um, go ahead with your questions, and then we'll um, open to the public for some comments. Well, I do have a number of questions, so I, I appreciate uh, appreciate the fact that I'm causing other people to wait. Um, I have a question about the connectivity uh, proposal, which I thought was very good, but it, I, I wonder uh, why the city, uh, why the proposal seems to retain the commitment to palm trees. Um, it seems to me that if, if, if we want the pe people to walk from the beach to the uh, downtown on a hot day, to provide trees that provide no shade um, seems counterproductive. I know we have this Miami beach or somehow uh, this some beach mythology about palm trees, but it seems to me that they really are not con con conducive to encouraging people to walk. Um, and so I just wonder what is the logic behind uh, continuing to see that the way to get connectivity is visually with palm trees rather than with actual helping people by uh, encouraging people to, to walk. Um, so that's certainly, you know, a fair comment to make. I think, you know, our thinking just initially was to replicate um, some of the existing streetscape, which does include palms in that neighborhood. Um, you know, if we want to take it in a different direction, that's certainly a um, comment and that we can you know, absolutely act on. Okay, it's a pet peeve of mine having tried to walk between those two locations many times and uh, found it very unenjoyable. Well, my next question has to do with a concern I tend to have with a plan, and it sort of relates to Commissioner Kennedy's, uh, uh, as I understood the question about the San Lorenzo River plan, which is, the city seems to have a tendency to do these very beautiful plans that never get implemented. And one of the problems I see is financial feasibility. A number of the proposals in this, uh, the, the plan before us for the sort of civic improvements seem to me to be quite expensive. And I just wonder if, um, I know, you know, on the one hand, we're doing a general plan but since we're so worried about the housing component, I wonder why we're not equally as worried about the financial component. Because to have a plan that's going to that looks good, but is never going to be the public improvements are not going to be implemented because there's no way to finance them. It seems kind of productive. So I guess my question is: Is there going to be any financial analysis of uh, the the civic improvements that are being proposed in the in the plan? Um, so I might ask 
bill to weigh in on that. Um, I, I think as we have it scoped right now, I don't know that specifically a financial analysis is part of that scope, like to, to that level. Is that, I think that's right, Bill, is that right? No, we, no, we have a scope. We've got EPS involved in the project and um, they're gonna look, they have it scoped to look at, at high level. So it'd have to be orders of magnitude costs type of analysis but also just the general financial feasibility of the project and how that might carry forward. I think the other component of that is discussions with the warriors and what their intent is. And then, you know, Laura, uh, Sarah has been talking about the potential for a development agreement. So there's probably a lot of components to that, to what's possible. And I appreciate your comments about whether or not a plan is feasible or not. At this stage, we're trying to lay out a, a vision and then that's gonna now get refined and, and pulled back. So this is the right time to be able to start to do that. But there will be a EPS is going to look at financial feasibility. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Bill. Bill I, uh, I had a conversation with staff earlier today and many of my questions got answered. So um, one of the questions I asked, and I don't know whether you've been able to get the answer to it, was how many uh, affordable housing units are going to be de demolished in order to relocate the Laurel Street extension? So, um, yeah, so I did get a chance to follow up on that. That is a, a board and care facility that has 48 beds um, and provides round the clock care for folks that need supportive services, essentially. Um, and so, and I think as we had talked about in, you know, when we met, you know, the relocation of the roadway assumes that that facility has been replaced or relocated either within the project area or elsewhere in the county, right? So we could have, we would have to have language in the plan that really talked about phasing and, you know, said that this vision of relocating the roadway shall not happen until such time as, you know, this facility is relocated and replaced um, and all of the, you know, existing tenants are adequately provided for the care that they need. So, um, you know, there are ways that we could do that and um, the opportunity of eventually relocating that road would really allow like slightly larger um, building footprints on those two northern parcels if we can recapture that Laurel Street extension. So, um, yeah, at this point, we want to keep it in there as sort of like the high level vision and receive more feedback about it. Um, and, you know, we recognize that that facility is crucial in the county and would have to be uh, replaced or relocated. I'm going to have some comments about it, but I appreciate the answer to my question at this point. Um, the, another question I asked this morning had to do with um, could the same number, or the question is, how high would the building, how, what would, how tall, how many stories would the uh, proposed high density housing structures need to be if the power, uh, if the tower elements were eliminated? In other words, we sort of saw that in the baseline, but then we started moving into, you know, these big towers. And um, I, from the, you know, the stiff presentation, it seems clear that the, to, to achieve the same number of units, we, it would probably be necessary to go above the height, le the height level in the, in the existing downtown, but it wouldn't be necessary to go to 20 stories. And so I'm wondering if the uh, site as a whole, the whole site was used for uh, development of the housing as it is uh, in other sites, um, how how many stories would the, uh, would the new developments have to be to achieve the same number of units? Uh, Justin, do you have any insight that you could offer about that? Sorry, I'm not quite sure I understood the question. It was, it was looking for a, a parallel without, a parallel unit count without going to- Without using towers. Flight, so flight, if, we built, towers. Towers. if we built blocks instead of towers, for those same number of units, what kind of building heights are we talking about? What it, from a from sort of a practical limitation and building code standpoint, um, that the buildings are going to reach a, about a, a seven story height as a maximum, and that's kind of the limits of wood construction, kind of the, the economics of of the building and development. Um, so I, I would I would 
if, if I'm understanding correctly, that, um, that I, th I think that would be, and that that's consistent with how the existing downtown plan is written and what heights right. are are allowed there. I think that's that's more or less what's driven, kind of a, a 75 to 85 foot height. Um, I'm not sure if I'm understanding. So, no, I'm not. I guess I'm not being clear. The plan scenario two and three have pretty high towers, uh, and there is a whole schema, an urban design schema to justify why that's um, would be a, a potentially appropriate way to go. Well, if you don't want to have those towers, if the community doesn't want to have those towers. Um, how could we achieve, how high would the building have to go in order to achieve the same number of units that are in this uh, scenario? Such that scenario two has 1,600 units. Now it has some tower, uh, towers that, if I understood it correctly, go up to like 18 stories or 19 stories. Uh, what if um, the, what, what is an alternative approach to receiving, to achieving those uh, 18, uh, those 1,600 units without having uh, buildings that uh, are significantly higher than anything else that's, that's been seen in Santa Cruz. So if, if we were to blanket the area at a consistent height, is that the question? Instead yes. of sort of well, stopping no, if you're just using the, the, the high density sites. Right, so if we took those 1600 units or even like let's just pick the you know whatever the number is that fits on blocks a b c d right and instead of having towers we imagine a world where clt can go much higher and we can build wood construction to higher heights would the whole would all of those blocks go to 100 feet would they go to 120 feet rather than having a 200 foot tower element that's the question yeah we can certainly we can certainly plug it into the model and study it pretty quickly if it would if it would be of interest I, I just you know it kind of from a from a back of the envelope I'm getting you know, I'm guessing it would instead of having everything at seven stories with some things that go up to a to a much higher you'd have a consistent and 10 story blanket of development which which can feel pretty monolithic I mean if you if you were to go you know the the, the, the human perception is of that that street wall at the top and, and there's something about that um, kind of six to seven story height limit that's just kind of a classical urban fabric you know it's what you see in Paris it's what you see in uh, uh, other parts of kind of classically developed cities and um, you know there's, there's limitations too and some of those about how many flights of stairs people were willing to walk up before there were elevators there's there are a whole, whole host of considerations that, that make it practical to go to a certain height and more difficult to go above that but I'm just guessing it would be, you know, you'd see everything at, at 10 stories, something like that. If, I, if I'm understanding you now correctly, and we could we could dial into that and, and explore. Okay, it. well, that's a concern. I mean, that's my question. I'll have comments about it as well. I mean, going up 20, taking an elevator up 20 stories has its uh, issues, as in my mind, as along with other issues. Um, I want to clarify what we can do here tonight. Uh, the ch chair indicated that um, we're that this isn't an action item. Um, my understanding, though, is that if the commission wants to take action, um, it is able to do so. It's not listed in the agenda as an information item. It's in, in a listed as general business. Is there any uh, impediment to the commission uh, making a recommendation on what it would? Uh, recommend to the city council as a preferred alternative no there's not and in fact um you know if if there is a general consensus around that that could be illustrated by way of a motion um we would welcome that because that's just a really easy way to bring that formal feedback of a majority of members to the city council okay so whatever you. elements you would want to incorporate into a motion about what the the preferred scenario should incorporate that would be helpful Thank you. Um, that's how I, that's how I understood it. Um, as I'm understanding the discussion of the arena numbers, um, the is a there are a total number of units of something like 3,800, 3,700 units is going to be the total. But they're broken down into categories by various income levels. Am I? Is that not correct? Yes, that's correct. And 
as I'm understanding it, um, the, the chart and the graph, uh, and we talked about this this morning, about a third of the units um, are in the low income and very low income category. So the, in this, um, in this period of time, under this housing, our current housing element, we've been very successful in exceeding the total arena numbers. And that's largely because we've had many more bulk market rate units than were allocated or than the target was. We've had a much harder time uh, achieving the low income and particularly the very low income units. And so I just wonder if any thought is given to, you know, requiring that the, that the density that the, the new units that are, are going to be proposed for this expansion area meet the same distribution that is, um, since the arena numbers are playing such a big role in our thinking about meeting this density, that in fact, there should also be the commitment of meeting the low and lower income, the lower income uh, requirements as well. Has that, you know, has any consideration of that been? Um, yeah, so as I, um, as I mentioned when I was answering uh, Commissioner Greenberg's question, the, our assumption at this point is that the city's existing um, inclusionary would apply. And, um, you know, that's sort of our baseline assumption. And that's an area where we, you know, there's certainly other um, options that we can look at and um, comments on, on that topic would, you know, we can take those under consideration. I, um, you know, financial feasibility being a reality, that is something that we, you know, will want to think about carefully. Um, and I know that, you know, the warriors have said, um, they're interested in um, having a privately funded development. They've said that in the past. And I think that part of the way that they are going to get there is by capturing some of the value from the housing development. I don't know all of the mechanisms that they're intending to use on that. Um, you know, you'd have to ask them how that works. And, um, you know, that is kind of one of the goals is making sure the arena can work and that the housing can work. So like all of that is sort of in the Melu here. Um, and, you know, just to reiterate, Let's talk about that. I think that's a that's a really good topic to add to the discussion, and um, you know, something that we can certainly take a look at. It's a fascinating but confusing uh, thought that the arena, the warriors that own no property, are somehow going to uh, get a financial benefit from development on property owned by somebody else. But as you say, we can talk about that at, at another time. Um, I had a question about the sort of worries around SB 35 and, oh my God, you know, we may have 10%. There's, uh, it's, and that that is somehow going to remove the city's discretion over housing development. One of the things I've learned on the planning commission is the city has almost no discretion over any housing developments anyway, under SB 330 um, and um, the, um, What's the other thing that we have to meet? Um, the, the city can only use objective standards um, and the, it can't make a, a housing project infeasible by its requirements. And so we've, the city is already under recent state laws extremely limited in its ability to um, regulate uh, and approve not approve or even condition uh, new housing developments. And as we saw, at least um, having listened to some of the uh, city council meetings on the SB 35 project that went through the, um, the process, the city can impose, uh, it may not, it, it's not, the project won't go through CEQA, but the, the city can impose objective standards. So I'm not sure that um, uh, you know, obviously it would be good to meet the, um, the, the, the arena targets, but the idea that somehow SB 35 is going to put us, I, I, I don't understand why the, given the other limitations on the city's discretion, why SB 35 is going to be that much different than, uh, what, or, oh, I remember what my other thing is, most of the sites that are being developed are 
uh, are going to be justified under CEQA exemptions. They're not going to be subject to CEQA anyway, because they're transit oriented, they're infill. Um, so there's a real question whether there's going to be any CEQA review anyway. So why Mr. this particular Mr. concern under about SB 35? Yeah, so, I'm gonna hold, hold on a second, um, Sarah. I'm gonna hold that. I think we're veering into the discussion realm and I wanna be conscientious of the members of the public who have hung in for two plus hours. Um, so I think that we'll have plenty of time and we will be sure to come back to a discussion around SB 35, but I do wanna open the public hearing and allow the folks who have hung in there for two plus hours to provide us with some information that can help inform our, our discussion and our, our possible um, recommendation tonight. So um, we'll go ahead and open the public hearing and I do see a hand and thank you so much, Anna, for hanging in for a long, long time. Um, you'll go ahead and have uh, three minutes and uh, we would love to hear your comments. Thank you. Hi, good evening, can you hear me? Okay, great. Yeah, Hi, my name is Anna Gerger. My, I guess my name is on the screen now. I actually live on Cliff Street. So I'm thrilled to be um, hearing about this from a commissioner. I, I, I was kind of surprised not to have heard about it before because there's not a lot of us on this cul-de-sac. It's just my house on the corner, big pink house, uh, some townhouses next to me, and then Elview Motel the, uh, um, across the street. Excited to hear about the downtown improvements, um, improving, you know, the corridor between downtown and the beach and the boardwalk. Um, and also, uh, I appreciate uh, somebody, uh, Bill Wiseman, mentioning that view and, you know, perhaps that sort of ceremonial connection that you all brought up, um, because it is really beautiful at the top of those stairs. I think a lot could be done there. I have heard a rumor, I don't know if it's true, about that huge tree right there being actually a native burial site. I don't know if it's true. My mom's had for years ideas of art and music dance performances around there being a, a good idea for community engagement and tourism as well as along the river. In any case, I'm also speaking on behalf of um, my parents who also are on Cliff Street um, and they're also business owners. They run Cliff Crest Inn, which is a um, 1880s Victorian, formerly the home of Lieutenant Governor William Jeter. So from the same era of that Golden Gate Villa that was mentioned earlier. Um, just real quick, traffic safety, um, pedestrian, you know, foot traffic, etc. Currently in this cul-de-sac, it's a lot of police and crime activity. Um, a car has literally gone off the end of the cul-de-sac down the stairs two, three times in the last couple of years. So it, some safety improvement is needed. Um, and really, my big interest here is better car and pedestrian flow and solutions um, for the traffic flow to and from the beach. One huge concern is parking, of course, um, which, you know, leads me also to mention better shuttling, maybe really well advertised and labeled shuttles to downtown restaurants, for example, so people aren't also stuck eating just at boardwalk snack shacks and wharf restaurants. Um, the comment of palm trees from Commissioner Schifrin tracked me up because pg &E has actually removed all the palm trees on my property. So I just want you to be aware of that. They were too close to the power lines or something. So do keep in mind, um, you know, some other type of um, trees or shading. Illumination, unique illumination ideas. I love hearing that. As long as us residents here can still sleep at night, um, I think that's a great idea. We also have a huge garbage problem. So if you're going to increase pedestrian or, you know, um, car traffic, we really need a garbage solution. I called the city about this before, never heard back. There's not even a public garbage can on this corner. And it's a huge throughway for locals, um, whether residents or transients and for tourism. So we're talking about, you know, dirty diapers and the like also. Um, so in terms of sustainability and environment, I want to keep that in mind. There's going to be an increase in garbage um, and public bathroom, perhaps even. And scenario three mentioned, I think up to 160 feet in a building D. I think I'm just wondering, would that impact the view from the top of Cliff Street that we were talking about? Something to consider. Um, one commissioner mentioned that that view wasn't really 
you know, we didn't see that in the, the plans. So I just wanted to um, second that thought. And um, I think I've gone through everything and I'm sorry if I went over three minutes, but I, I, I took notes and hopefully hit everything that I wanted to mention. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Anna. You definitely deserved as much time as you needed for the two hours plus. Um, it, it, so this is gonna be a, the last call and I'm gonna give it a second here for any members of the public to go ahead and raise your hand if you would like to comment. Do that by pressing star nine on your phone and looks like we got another hand. So uh, please everybody go ahead and put your hands up if you would like to speak. Um, and we can go ahead and unmute the caller with the last three numbers, 929. Go ahead, caller. Hello, good evening. Uh, my name is Brian Shields. I'm a field rep for Carpenters Local 505 in Aptos. And uh, first of all, I wanna say, uh, that the plan is very impressive and the amount of thought has, that's been put into it and the total uh, amount of how long it's gonna take to get to where there's actually ground being broken is uh, the work that's going into it is impressive. Um, <clears throat> but one of the things I wanted to say as far as uh, being a community benefit, I'm a resident of Santa, of, uh, Santa Cruz County and uh, and having, we have over 500 members that live here in Santa Cruz County. And so being able to put those people to work on this project is a, an important aspect of, of having this, this project built. Um, so I just wanted to add that in. Sorry, I'm a little jumbled up late for me. Uh, have a good night. Thank you so much for your comments. We really appreciate you um, hanging in there and, and thank you. Um, okay, last call for any public comments. Uh, you can raise your hand, star nine. Going once, going twice. Um, I see Anna's hand again, and I feel like I have uh, an inclination to let her go ahead and talk one more time. So <laughs> go ahead and let Anna have another couple minutes. So Anna, this time you'll have two minutes. You can go ahead and oh, unmute thank you. yourself. Thank you. Thank you. I don't even need that much. I just looked at my notes and I forgot one big thing. I did, I said something about parking, but I would like to expand just a little bit. Um, as a resident, you know, who lives three blocks from the boardwalk, um, I'm actually trapped at my house on weekends and um, during the summertime or anytime there is a holiday weekend. And what I mean by that is I can't even go to Trader Joe's um, without having to spend an hour uh, in the car on the way back. So, you know, of course, more environmentally, you know, yes, I can walk and I can take my e-bike, which is what I do. That's the solution. But I just want to bring that up because, you know, we are residents here. The, the sign on Cliff Street around the my parents' bed and breakfast says that it's residential only, but that's not enforced. I mean, let's be real. That's the main, that's the main way people get from Ocean Avenue. They snake up Third Street and go left on Cliff Street, right? So it's just... I, I really just hope that you're taking into consideration, I'm sure you are, studies about traffic flow, impact on the residents, um, and it's just not to mention environment. So again, I wanna emphasize shuttling. I know there's a shuttle from the city hall, but I just don't think it's um, very well known or advertised. It may even need to be advertised on Highway 17. So that people coming in actually know more about it. They can prep for it, they're ready for it. And um, and then again, I wanted to add, you know, adding some sort of a shuttle system that gets people downtown so that it's not only through that Cliff Street way. That's all, thank you. All right, thanks, Anna. All right, uh, see one, one more hand up. Um, uh, and I, I'm asking everyone on the line right now to raise their hand um, because I'm gonna cl cl close the public hearing. Um, so if you want to speak, you need to raise your hand now so that we can see how many people are left to speak. Um, and it looks like we're gonna be going to our last speaker who is Jack McCourt. Um, Jack, uh, go ahead and... Um, identify yourself and uh you will have three minutes go ahead hey yeah i'm can you hear me yes I'm, go ahead. Uh, I'm jack mccourt 
and I've lived in Santa Cruz my whole life. I uh, currently live in Boulder Creek. Um, but I just want to say that I am opposed to any parking minimums in this new downtown plan. I don't want to see like big building, 10 story buildings in the first like three stories of it are just a parking garage or something. So that's something I'm really sensitive to. Um, that's about it. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Looks like we have uh, another speaker. Last two numbers uh, are three. Um, go ahead and unmute yourself. You will have three minutes. A uh, number ending in three, three. Go ahead and identify yourself if you choose, and you'll have three minutes. Uh, yeah, good evening. Uh, this is Rafa Sonnenfeld. Um, I'm sorry I missed most of the presentation for the downtown. I was just in front of the meeting. But I did have an um, opportunity to visit the um, presentation that was at the Kaiser Arena, I believe, um, two weeks ago. Um, and um, I, I thought all of the, um, the options were really impressive. But what really, I guess, sort of struck me was that even with the um, most you know, aggressive plans for downtown expansion, um, you know, the tallest buildings, the, the, the most density, we're still not um, uh, building enough in, in order to accommodate all of the regional housing needs allocation that we have to plan for in the sixth cycle. So I just encourage the city you know, really think big um, because you know it's we can't put all of the housing in Santa Cruz downtown but if people don't want you know large apartment buildings in single-family neighborhoods and um, uh, you know and people talk about wanting to have housing downtown this is how we have more housing um, in places where we don't need to have cars and where we can have Know, improved access to transit, and I agree with the previous caller. Um, you know, I'd, I'd like to see you know elimination of parking minimums for for, for these sorts of projects, um, so that we can have more transit-oriented development in places like downtown where people don't need to drive as much. So, um, I, I encourage you know the the city to to think most aggressively with the EIR. That doesn't assume that you know that the highest, biggest projects will necessarily go forward, but it means that, that we'll be prepared uh, and we'll have the environmental um, impact uh, research done beforehand so that, that we know what, is, what you know, can, be, um, can be achieved and, and how it can be mitigated. And that's um, something that needs to happen. So I um, encourage you all to uh, 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 think big and that's, that's how we're going to, to meet the housing needs that our community needs. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you for members of the public who hung around. I'm going to go ahead and close the public hearing and bring it back before the commission for discussion. Um, so I see Commissioner Schifrin's hand up. So if you have comments, go ahead and. I will have you. comments, but I'll, I'll wait. Oh, okay. up from my questions. Uh, Chair Dawson, okay. be yes. before we start, uh, could I ask that Sarah just put that slide up with the six uh, things she wanted input on or say them again, just so I can give you the input you're looking for? I wrote them down pretty quick. Yeah, sure. Uh, maybe Bill can help me <clears throat> find that slide and pull it back up. But um, in general, we're looking for um, a targeted number of housing units um, sort of like some kind of range or ballpark that we can focus on. We want to talk about the proposed realignment and circulation. So moving the street, closing the streets, you know, temporary closures. Can I get input on that? The beach connectivity to Cliff Street, we've already heard a couple of questions and comments on that. Obviously, building heights are one, going to be a component of the conversation. Um, looking at those two arena locations, if there's any sort of, um, you know, consensus around a preferred location. We'd like to hear that. And then uh, also just comments about civic spaces. So um, locations, programming, um, 
thoughts, ideas, concerns. Okay. Um, so back to the commission. Um, I, uh, before we um, move to Commissioner Schifrin, I'd like to go to Commissioner Greenberg. And um, you mentioned a bit about this direct and indirect displacement. And I'm wondering if you could just share with the commissioner and the public, uh, the commission and the public, just um, kind of some more information about what that is and isn't, what we know about it, what other cities are doing about it. Um, and I think that would be really helpful as our discussions as we go forward. And then we'll go ahead and go to Commissioner Schifrin next. Okay, thanks, Commissioner Dawson, and I'm going to try to be quick. I mentioned to Commissioner Dawson that I was interested in this, um, and so and I prepared a few slides, and I'm going to try to be really quick just to kind of visualize the location of this development in relation to the surrounding area and some of the debates that are going on in our region. And I could share my screen. Uh, let me see here. Um, here we go. And I'm going to just... Um, hold on. So hopefully you can see, and I'm just going to go here. And basically, um, you know, there's this big debate going on. How do we balance production of new housing um, with other kinds of forms of protection of, of tenants as well as preservation of existing affordable housing? Um, and I know we've talked um, in this body about the work of the Urban Displacement Project, and there's a, a great new study um, by the Urban Displacement Project, Housing Market Interventions and Residential Mobility in the San Francisco Bay Area, which is one of the first studies that really tries to balance an analysis of the impact of new market rate housing with or without the presence of other forms of regulation of the housing market in terms of the degree to which it does or doesn't displace um, tenants at different levels of affordability. And basically the gist of it is that, um, you know, yes, we need new new supply. Yes, we need new production. Um, but at the same time, um, with simply inclusionary zoning, you know, and those kinds of levels, we're going to see a lot of churn. We're going to see people moving in uh, at different income levels, but most of the people moving out are going to be at the lower income levels. And over overall, uh, the benefits are going to mostly accrue to upper income levels. Um, and this is based on their analysis of, of the greater Bay Area, not including Santa Cruz, but I think we're seeing similar levels of vulnerability in our region that we could extrapolate from this kind of a study. And I just wanted to say that as a result, all across the country in our region, people are doing um, analyses of the impacts of new development on displacement. Um, and um, I'm just using stuff on the West Coast. There's stuff all over the country as well, including, um, you know, um, a really thoughtful conversation that happened in the city of Watsonville with their downtown specific plan and EIR. And at the bottom of that bullet list, you'll see a whole, there was a whole um, advisory committee dedicated to the question of housing policies relating to anti-displacement. Um, and so... And similarly, in San Jose, there's this new um, adopted in 2022 citywide anti-displacement strategy. Um, so really, this language of how do we think um, in a holistic way about combining new development, new production with really powerful and meaningful means of, of trying to, you know, to, to regulate the housing market um, in such a way that it doesn't cause larger waves of displacement and thus the net effect you know, is not a win um, for affordable housing, that you're ultimately displacing as many or, or potentially more people than you're putting in through inclusionary um, provisions in the, in the new development. And I just wanted to call our attention to the map um, that we've been talking about with the objective standards discussion produced by Gretchen Reagan Hart and Diane Alfaro you know, looking at the legacy in our community um, of exclusionary zoning and the concern that we have about where the housing is, the multifamily housing is, that houses the majority of low-income people in the city of Santa Cruz, the majority of Latinos in the city of Santa Cruz, which is right across the river from the site that's going to be um, the location of this massive investment um, of capital and new housing with huge impact potentially of indirect displacement. In, in that neighborhood. And so the net effect could be both one of loss of affordable housing as well as, as demographic impacts in terms of race and class. 
um, and really vulnerable communities. This is a big issue um, in the Watsonville discussion as well. A lot of concern about the impact um, for the Latino community in Watsonville. And I think we, we, we face the same issue um, very much so here um, with 20% of our population Latino concentrated in the downtown area, right within and adjacent to this development. Um, and I just wanna point out that we see already um, if you just go to Redfin and you look at the sale of multifamily housing over the last four years, um, huge numbers of sales of multifamily house, houses. Um, and, you know, for people who are concerned about, you know, what it might mean to preserve existing affordable housing, it's painful to see the scale at which a lot of the existing housing is being sold um, and, and kind of retrofitted for higher income folks. And as a result, um, causing, you know, these forms of, of displacement, and we're seeing, and um, in, in conversations with with people uh, with whom I work and who I know, and friends of mine who live in some of these units, people hearing that there's there's word on the street that this new development is going on, and as a result, landlords are raising prices, and are and or you know investors are coming in, recognizing the very meaningful opportunity that they have um, to upgrade existing affordable housing in the region, and so over. A number of years you're seeing you know net loss of you know tens um even hundreds of units potentially um and so and i just want to point out this is a national phenomenon is now the time to invest in multifamily real estate um with a tight housing market forcing many to remain renters longer with small communities like ours in suburbs and smaller metros locations for telecommuters units like what we see on the left which previously sold in the 1990s for $400,000 um, are being uh, upgraded and sold um, for what here might even be considered given that it's um, 12 beds and eight baths, uh, you know, a deal, but is ultimately going to displace the, um, the residents who are currently there because it's such a, a major um, investment opportunity. Um, and so just to keep in mind that, you know, and this is my final slide, that there is national conversation, there's a regional conversation about how to distinguish between, you know, really important and needed revitalization and meeting arena numbers with concerns about gentrification and displacement and really powerful tools that are being developed. This is just one example in New York City um, by the Department of City Planning, not only looking at environmental impacts, but displacement impacts um, of new development, recognizing areas that are vulnerable, recognizing areas that have concentrations of um, of people of color and low-income residents, um, and really kind of valuing the presence of, of that diversity um, in race and class terms, not only within a particular development area, but within you know the larger region where this uh, development is occurring, um, and uh, perhaps including, and I don't think this was included in the community con the comments, folks from those communities, organizations from those communities, um, you know, local residents, um, as, we, as we've seen in San Jose, as we've seen in Watsonville and elsewhere, in the conversation about how to make this a really beneficial development for everyone. Um, so um, I just wanted to throw that out there and to say that, um, and I'm going to just stop sharing my screen, um, that I, at the same time, am a huge fan of dense, affordable development, and I'm very excited about the potential for affordability and the replacement of units within the development, but to keep in mind these larger conversations and perhaps to include, um, you know, a, a new level of, of discussion, maybe an advisory committee um, and an and analysis of the impact as well as an analysis of potential mitigations that would be meaningful for, for our city. So that's, I wanted to throw that in, you know, as a bullet point of something that would be really wonderful to discuss. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Greenberg. We'll go ahead and go over to Commissioner Schifrin, and then if other folks want to have some comments, um, you can go ahead and raise your hand and we'll put you on deck. Go ahead, Commissioner Schifrin. Thank you. Um, I want to appreciate the staff report. I thought there was a lot of useful information, a lot of good, uh, a lot of good slides. I actually printed the screen many times and will, I'm sure, go back with pleasure to go over some of these drawings and, you know, uh, scenarios that have been presented. I do <clears throat> have some concerns, um, but I, I, I do want to provide 
my, my own, you know, some input on these various questions that staff has asked. And for me, I'll start with an easy one, which is the arena location. I think it really makes sense to locate the arena between French Street and Pacific. I think that um, will allow for uh, housing, um, a, you know, higher density housing, mostly adjacent to the river where it will have less of a visual impact on, on the adjacent, uh, on, the, on the existing neighborhood. But I think that um, to me makes sense. And, you know, what I'm, what I'm hoping we can do tonight um, and I'm, um, I'm intending to make a motion that re recommends to the commission, uh, the council, a preferred alternative for consideration in the EIR. And I think it's important for us to try to do that because once that uh, a preferred alternative is uh, determined and an EIR is prepared on it, it becomes very difficult to change <clears throat> The components of that alternative, because potentially by changing the components, um, the, um, the EIR has to be done again because there could be new significant impacts. So, you know, my sense is it makes sense to think about what um, seems reasonable and go forward with that. The the. Other, let me go to my the next one where I feel pretty strongly about, and that has to do with the proposed circulation and realignments. I think it's a real mistake to uh, <clears throat> propose realigning the Laurel Street extension in a way that would remove the existing low-income housing. Um, one, from my work at the county, I know that the the there have been attempts over the last number of years to find other locations for that housing. It's very difficult to find another location and it will be very difficult to fund the construction of replacement that replacement housing. It's difficult enough for the city to get, and the city's been very successful at getting funding to subsidize affordable housing for new units. But this would not be new units. This would be moving existing units to put in a road. And I think it would be very hard to justify, and I don't see it happening. And I think the uncertainty about whether it will happen or not will make it more difficult to develop the housing sites that are adjacent to it. So I, I'm supportive of relocating uh, Laurel Street uh, extension to provide a more coherent site for uh, higher density housing but I think it should be adjacent to the existing low-income housing rather than adjacent to the hillside. Um, that will, I think, allow the projects to go forward more quickly and it will uh, uh, avoid the reduction in the number of uh, affordable housing units that would result from, uh, from the plan. So that would be, uh, that's, that would be a, um, a recommendation of mine that we we um, have staff or ask staff or recommend to the council that they approve uh, a preferred alternative with that uh, different realignment. Um, in terms of the number of housing units, this is a hard one. When I talk to the people who I talk to uh, who care about these things and I talk about, oh, they're just to wind about 1,300 new units, uh, you know, they start to lunge at my throat. So, you know, density is a very controversial issue in San Diego. Um, I think we need to find a balance. Um, and I would support 1,600 units. 1,600 units would provide about 43% of the arena target numbers. And I think that's a reasonable amount of uh, housing for a 29 acre site to be providing. And so I would uh, recommend, and it's, you know, it's between, it's significantly more than the 1300 in scenario, scenario one and only a hundred less than the 1700 in scenario three. So I think it, 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 from my perspective, it's a much more defensible number. 
The biggest concern I have, I think, is with the towers. To me, and maybe Santa Cruz has changed too much from the city I've been in for a long time and have fallen in love with, but 20-story towers are appropriate for San Francisco. I don't think they're appropriate for Santa Cruz. And that's why I asked the question about whether it's, you know, how high would the buildings have to go to be able, the new density have to go to be able to provide that 1,600 units. I think that's reasonable, and I'm supportive of that. But it's surprising to me to talk about having block housing discussed in a negative way, since that's all the housing that we have in downtown, is what is, we don't have towers. We have housing, you know, housing and other structures that cover the site. And I think it's possible to design them well, and that's what I would support. So I don't think it's, I think it's not going to be very popular to go to 20 stories. I'm reminded of the Coast Hotel project, which everybody loved until people saw the EIR and what it would look like, and it was ultimately shelved because of the public opposition. I think we need to look into the future and try to find some balance about what's going to be acceptable to the community. I'm fascinated with the proposal or the presentation that Commissioner Greenberg made about off-site displacement. I think that that is a real issue, and the data that she provides is pretty, for me anyway, persuasive. And I think it would make sense to recommend that perhaps the city, our city, sort of follow a little bit in the footsteps of Watsonville and start to make a serious effort to really look at the potential consequences of the new plan on displacement in surrounding areas and try to figure out ways to respond to it. Finally, as might have been indicated from my questions about the affordable targets in the RENA numbers, I think if we're going to have this amount of housing in this area, we need to increase the affordable housing requirements and have them reflect, maybe not on a project-by-project basis, although I think the inclusionary project requirements should go up, but certainly in terms of the development and the whole expansion area, we should be getting the same proportion of lower, low and very low income units as it's being, as our targets would direct us to provide. Those are my comments, and my intention, if it's acceptable to other commissioners, is to make a motion along those lines as a recommendation to the city council for the preferred alternative as this process moves forward. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Schifrin. Over to Commissioner Kennedy and then Commissioner Greenberg, you're on deck. All right, there's a whole lot here. I'll try to kind of condense it, but be prepared. It's going to take a few minutes. So I guess first I just wanted to, you know, really declare that I find this indirect displacement thing is really important, and like I really think that's something we should look at, and I appreciate that presentation. I just wonder if that kind of direction needs to come from council. Like I'd love to see it happen, but I think that's where that direction would come from. So I look forward to hearing more about that and seeing if we can integrate that into our policies here. So I brought a prop. My background here is Frank Lloyd Wright's Mile High Tower, and this is a skyscraper that Frank Lloyd Wright, I don't know if you can see it. You can Google it on your own. He designed this in 1956 because Frank Lloyd Wright really got it 
he knew that in a city, your land was going to be a park, housing, you know, or a building or parking. And um, so I just brought that. I was thinking about that. We're not proposing a mile high, but it's that same trade-off, you know. Um, I should point out he was hoping for new technology and thought that flying cars would be attaching to this building if it was ever built. It was never built, but it's still a great plan. So um, I love those towers, as expected, and I certainly support the housing numbers in the third scenario, the most that we can get down there. I'd be up predictably enough to go for a little bit more, um, but that's my take on the numbers and the towers. Um, I also want to talk a little bit more about the last step of the downtown plan, you know, that extension and how well that worked, you know, approving those close to 200 fully market rate units, unlock the door to all these grants for Pacific Station North, Pacific Station South. On top of it, that development package has funded continuing the Maple Street Alley all the way through the mall. Like this is like a long-term dream. So I see this next plan as just doing that again and bigger and better, you know. But I want to say that that worked, right? We approved a project with no affordable housing and the city, our awesome staff, parlayed that into all these grants, all these money that came into our community to build all that out. So, you know, it's, it's looking at the whole picture. I'm glad we're doing that. Um, but that's a huge success. We just need to keep doing that. In my book, that was not a failure, though some people would disagree with me. Okay, and then um, my next comment, I just love the menu of public benefits. I think that's the way to get things done. I hear all the time from developers, just tell us what we can do and we'll find out how much it costs. I have really personally been thinking about teacher housing quite a lot and um, just want to put that out there. I know there's tons of needy groups, but um, my son just finished pre-kindergarten, had a great young teacher for the year, you know, kind of dropped into Zoom world and uh, worked here for one year and has left. So um, this has been happening, you know, since I was a small child in this community. And I just wonder if teacher housing is the one that we could put in the zoning or prioritize in that list so that we actually get some. Because um, that's that just echoes through the generations here when we can't keep our teachers in this town. So I'll throw that out there. Of course, there's all sorts of other uh, needy groups, but that one for me is particularly salient right now. Um, and coming with that is like two to three bedroom units. We got to keep on that. Studios are great, but boy, do we have a lot of those going into the ground. Okay. Um, let me go back to the list. Uh, I really like the realignment plan. We looked at that with the Warriors Stadium, and I get it. I mean, we're not going to take that building out to put a street there, but if you look at the plan, it just recovers a ton of wasted land. That whole thing is just inefficient in my mind, so I really like that. I'm excited about that beach connectivity to Cliff Street. Um, that's a really great thing. Um, I'll be a little political in saying that I think that's a connection to a future rail station you know, down the road. So let's keep that in mind on the 30, 50 year plan or whenever that's going to happen. Um, but that's just great. And reutilizing that staircase that's there. I really like that. Um, yeah. So building heights, I think those towers are fine. I think the alternative is the neighborhoods of the corridors. And I think that's much worse. And I think uh, politically we found out that that's not going to work. So um, that's the alternative here is this project in the right spot or more housing in the neighborhoods, which is a hot button topic in this town, or really, really bad buildings on the corridors, because we have a severe weakness in our planning on those corridors. So we would not only be getting buildings, we'd be getting really bad buildings, in my opinion. So uh, let's do it here. This is where we want it. Um, what else can I say? Okay, so two more quick ones, and these are, are again, are pretty fine grain for zoning discussion, but I want to put them out there based on experience. Um, we need the bike community in the design of these public spaces, like at this level, I think. The Warriors Stadium, you know, we wanted to make it kind of a model of bike storage, and they had like a bike valet for a while, and we put in some bike racks, but you know, 
we need people on bikes down here and nobody's locking their bike outside downtown. So I don't know how we put that in zoning, but just prioritize that above everything else. There's plenty of resources in town that could just tell us how to do that perfectly. And that comes with design down the road. Um, one other minor note, when I was on the commission, um, we had a, a lot of meetings about the Beach Flats Community Garden Project, and they kind of lost some of their land. It's a long story, but I wonder if there's opportunities to give some of this new land to that group to put a little garden into this neighborhood. They're right there already. This is a community that, even though they're close physically, like doesn't really connect to downtown. So I just want to throw that out there. Maybe a little garden plot would be a good use of some of that civic space and give those folks some more land to uh, farm. Let's see, arena location, that's easy. I think that middle lock is a uh, middle block, excuse me, between the two streets is better just because it's more of a rectangle. And um, I love the civic spaces. That's really a grand dream. And we see with the resistance to like the, you know, the library project and all that stuff, everyone's saying, hey, save our farmers market parking lot. We need a civic space. So. Um, I agree. Like since the earthquake, we haven't had a big civic plaza and it'd be cool to get one finally down here. So those are my comments. Oh my, am I not going to touch trees right now? Andy, I may give you a call later on uh, offline to discuss the long history of palm trees on this street and these plans. But um, this doesn't matter. The trees don't matter. This is about big buildings and housing and trees come and go. When I was young, I thought they were there forever. Now I'm 46, they come and go. Um, so we'll leave that there, whether they're palm trees or not. Let's get some housing built. Um, thanks, everybody. Okay, over to Commissioner Greenberg and then over to Commissioner Kong. Okay, Hi. thank you, um, everyone, for your very thoughtful um, comments. And um, yeah, I, uh, I in, in my, you know, I still feel like, um, a newbie on this commission, although I'm trying to get up to speed always, but I'm I'm constantly trying to figure out this balance between how to understand what we can do procedurally and also what how best to move strategically um, in in order to get what we hope accomplished. Um, so I'm just saying that to um, to preface this question. So I as I'm, I've said a number of times, and, and I even said this evening, I'm a big fan of density and I and downtown density and infill. And um, so this plan in general, and I also um, want to see it accomplished um, and uh, with as little kind of uh, pushback as possible. So I'm inclined to support the notion of this middle path, which is only 100 units less, which is a middle path but still 1,600 units and still really significant. Um, I'm also, um, and have I've also said previously, into this idea of distributing the density, um, and I understand the corridors is a question. I don't think we should necessarily see it as an either or um, and give up on the corridors, um, certainly on the west side and certainly on the lower, you know, beyond the corridors on the lower west side and, and other areas where there's, there's such capacity um, for, um, for, for density. Um, and so, um, I'm in, in, in that camp. And I think also, um, you know, the question proceed that, um, Commissioner Kennedy raises about who should determine and, you know, uh, the questions around, uh, indirect displacement, secondary displacement, um, and how to think about, um, anti-displacement policies that are meaningful for our community is, a, is an important one. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm open to and interested in hearing how people think, you know, that would make sense and who would strike, for instance, an anti-displacement advisory commission. And um, along those lines, um, I really support and, and appreciate the, the point about the Beach Flats Community Garden. In general, I think communities in Beach Flats and Lower Ocean should be included in this discussion more, more than they, they are currently. Um, and that includes the community around the garden um, and Nueva Vista and others, as well as, um, you know, community groups, CAB and others who've been really involved in, in supporting um, tenants in those communities. Um, 
I think that Commissioner uh, Schifrin's idea of increasing the inclusionary is a good idea. And I should say that at the Watsonville um, presentation, that was presented as a best practice um, in other downtown plans throughout the Bay Area. Berkeley, within its downtown plan, had 50% inclusionary. I think San Leandro had 20%, uh, sorry, 25% whereas 20% was like, uh, like our community, the, the standard. So they upped it to 25% within the, um, the area plan. So I, I think that's a really good idea. Um, and I support the idea of teacher housing. I think that's a great idea um, if there's a way of thinking about that. And that was something that our affordable housing subcommittee was, was kind of focused on for a while, uh, was, was questions of the missing middle, was questions of workforce housing specifically for teachers. Um, and there's so many schools near near this development. I think it makes enormous sense. Um, shuttles, the the um, the resident who spoke about the traffic issues, um, I really love that idea and sort of amping up shuttle capacity. And um, there's so many young people going to these schools and wanting to go to the beach. People, you know, residents and others. Obviously, there's a lot of of biking, but I think that there's um, nobody seems to ever use these shuttles. I think she's really right. I've not known anyone to use the shuttles, so how we can change that. Um, and that's kind of a minor point, but it sounded really quite important for the residents in the area. I think that's it for me now. So I, you know, I, I support a lot of what's been said so far. Uh, and if, if it means that we can make a, uh, a motion that's, that's helpful for the, for the, um, for the council, um, I, I would support that. Thank you. Thank you. Over to Commissioner Conway. Thank you. And first of all, I want to thank the staff and the consultants for bringing this forward. It's really exciting to see it. And I was trying to remember the first time I was involved in a conversation about this area, and I'm pretty sure it was 20 years ago, um, and maybe a little bit more than that. So it's, um, and, and frankly, at the, the first conversation that I had all those years ago, I don't think that we could have imagined the vibrancy of, of what is actually coming forward. Um, and it's, it's really a great bunch of work. I, there's a, quite a lot of it I don't understand, but I'm going to have a lot of, I'm really anticipating um, walking the path as it proceeds. So thank you to um, everyone who's worked on this. It is really exciting. Um, and I also want to say how excited I am to hear that Commissioner and Schifrin, Schifrin and I agree on a bunch of points here. First of all, I was totally ready to go there on trees. So, you know, maybe not this time, but um, picturing a nice shady promenade there. I love the promenade along with many elements of it. Um, and I'm kind of thinking, yeah, I guess the Walnut Street vibe, maybe that's not it. I don't know with the beach. I don't know, but go for it on trees. I think it's a, it, it's a really great addition. Um, and the, the other thing is I love your point about really studying feasibility. Um, and, um, you know, and I know we have disagreed on that point a lot over the years. So bringing that up about, um, I'm glad that there's going to be a view of of developing a plan that is actually buildable um, and that doesn't just look pretty on a wall somewhere. I think that's that's really important. And financial buildability is, is one part of that. Um, I certainly agree with that. If we're gonna look at talking about um, changing the affordability numbers, which isn't, you know, it's, it's not part of this discussion today, but it certainly will be. Um, having a really solid financial um, um, and of course, we've talked about um, how how useful they they are useful, and I think that we it has been to our it hasn't strengthened our case to fail to study it. Um, so if we proceed on some of those things, I'll be I'll be really glad to see it. And the other thing, though, that I, I really disagree with Commissioner Schiffrin on is having first of all 10 story buildings all over the place down there the, the, i understood the question that you were going for but all i could think of as that question was being batted around is that we will not get the units without the towers and um you know does that need to get looked at a little bit more probably but raising all of them and filling up all of the space in attempt to get 
units at a lower level does not make this better, in my opinion. In fact, far from it. Um, and I don't know, Commissioner Kennedy, that the mile high uh, tower is gonna fit here ever, but the point is really important that what those towers give us is this amazing open space. And what that gives our community, it really does give us our there and um, the there that we've been talking about. Um, so getting the units, opening up the space. Um, I loved um, one of the comments by, um, and I, I can't remember who made the comment, but sort of showed us um, variation of heights, gives us sort of that, that hillside effect. Something's high, something's a little bit um, high, but not as high to sort of the shaping what we see. Um, I found that to be very compelling. Um, and um, I look forward to seeing that take shape. But I really strongly did not expect to like the towers. It kind of took my breath away the first time I looked at it because I too have been in Santa Cruz for a long time. And it was like, that is that it? And then I thought about, you know, that gathering space and that place for the community to be the community is really exciting. Um, I really liked the, um, you know, the, the changes in circulation and that kind of thing. And my first question was what's happening to the board and care facility. And I've spent some time over my career also um, certainly concerned about that facility. Um, I don't think it, it, it's not um, affordable housing. That isn't what it is. Um, it's a licensed facility, and I don't know if in this location of this is true, but they're often treated as a commercial use, which is neither here nor there to the really important and compelling need um, to be for the city to work with the county um, and make sure that um, what happens to um, that, that facility um, goes someplace where it is really feasible. I know it's struggled. Um, in that location, um, partly because of the, you know, the hillside behind it. Um, but I, again, I really agree with Commissioner Schifrin. It needs to be carefully considered. I do think that um, it, I, I mean, I don't know. It's been years since I looked at it. But um, a question of whether there might not be a better location for that facility has come up on more than one occasion. Um, but one way or another, those, that, um, that function is badly needed in this community and can't just be e erased. So, and I, and I know that um, city staff will work, work hard on that. Um, I uh, don't agree that we should be um, uh, trying to come to consensus on um, a specific number of units um, tonight. I understand um, your point Commissioner Schifrin, but um, I'm, I don't really support going that way tonight. And um, although that 1,600, maybe a little bit more, um, I do, um, I, is in the, the number that I kind of had in my mind. I also think it's a no-brainer to move the facility and move it over to the um, a, a block over. I think it, it just makes sense. I don't know why we wouldn't want that. And um, I'm also very interested in the visual from the hill. I'm not gonna make my case about sycamores because I think I'm already convinced that we shouldn't do that. And I think that's, um, that's enough for tonight. Thank you everybody for your careful consideration. Thank you, Commissioner Conway. Over to Commissioner Miss C.D. Miller. Uh, thank you, uh, my fellow commissioners. What a delight to hear from everybody tonight. I appreciate everyone's point of view and um, I learned a lot. So thanks for sharing your heart. Uh, I am uh, much, much appreciative of uh, Commissioner Greenberg's commentary about displacement and gentrification, and all those issues. Those are really important issues. Um, the the greatest success stories around that topic that I've read about are, are uh, where the community gets engaged around it. It's not left to the planning commissioners. It's not left to the, it's not left to anybody. It's it's left to the community to kind of explore the best way forward. And I, I don't think that's the topic here tonight, but uh, I do appreciate and value that um, approach. Um, I'm also uh, keenly aware 
that many of the lowest income residents of our community are right now uh, relocating because they can't afford to live here. And I'm also uh, keenly aware that the biggest driver of housing costs is the lack of housing. Um, when a supply of anything is uh, limited, the price goes up. And um, I think you know, building more housing is an important part of addressing the displacement problem. Um, I also want to remind um, maybe myself and maybe other people on this on this um, on this commission that part of the reason for this um, plan is to keep the warriors in Santa Cruz. And um, I don't know if, how many of you are warrior fans, but um, it's a terrific addition to our community. And I think it's um, really brings a broad cross section of our community together in a way that um, few other things can do that. And the warriors want to stay here. And we have an opportunity as a city to take advantage of their desire to stay and their desire to invest. And um, when you talk about the boarding care facility being relocated, I think it would be a very reasonable thing for the city to say to the warriors and you know and the development team, I'm not sure, I don't really even know who that is, but, but whoever it is, that the development process unfolds in a certain order and that you know before you do anything you have to find a new location for the board and care facility and it doesn't become the city's responsibility and I, and I appreciate Commissioner Schifrin's comments along those lines boy it's so difficult to get anything done but when you're the city it's really hard to get anything done but if you're a private developer and you're motivated by he's staying in town building an arena etc cetera, etc cetera, um, it wouldn't surprise me at all that that problem gets solved very quickly. Uh, but I think we need to like let them solve it um, and not meddle too much, um, but just make it clear. We want what, you know, I don't remember the number of beds, you know, 40 beds, or 60 beds, whatever it is. You need to you need to find a place for that. And that just becomes, you know, one of the things that um, that you have to take care of as the developer of, of this project. Um, I also want to, um, you know, I, I think the number of units, you know, I think I, I like 1600. It seems like the number of the night, uh, I'm good with 1600. I don't, I don't, 1700 is, you know, uh, not that much more. Um, and if that seems like a, a number that most people are, are comfortable with, I'm comfortable with that. Uh, um, as far as the, the tower thing goes, um, I think one of the um, opportunities um, that we have is, is to have towers. And I think the towers offer a, a visually interesting feature of our downtown. I don't like the pancake block building look. Um, I've been to Paris. I don't like Paris. <laughs> I don't like the every building in Paris is seven stories or six stories or whatever. I, I can't remember exactly how many stories. And the only things that stand up are the Eiffel Tower and the whatever, you know, the John, the Arc de Triomphe and you know, the other architectural features of the city. The rest of the city is so uniform in height, it's boring. Um, so I really like the idea of a, of a few towers, but I would also like to make sure that the Cliff Street lookout view to our downtown is not blocked by the towers. So I think, I think that the juxtaposition of those elements needs to be studied. It needs to be considered. And I think that, um, that that's something that the project team should do and maybe do that sooner rather than later so that it can be considered. Um, I wanted to also just kind of run down staff asked us specifically to comment on things. I, I created a minor comments or, you know, um, I wanted to mention the slurp. Um, I am familiar with the San Lorenzo urban uh, river plan. Um, that was part of the downtown plan that we um, considered when we did the um, the upgrade or the update to the downtown plan that's just north and is now resulting in development. And we did consider the the desire. I, I agree, high level stuff, uh, but they have some really important um, 
elements that they include in there in terms of how the river and the built environment interact and how they and their relationship and um, I think that needs to be referenced and it needs to be um, uh, included in the consideration and while we're on the river I really love this um, the river development the, you know the river edge development I know that was an important consideration in the downtown plan update that took place a few years back um, and the plans that I have seen um, are developing the river edge so that we have a more useful more beautiful relationship between our downtown built environment and the river habitat and I think that the marriage and the, the stitching together of those two elements uh, will do wonderful things for the quality of life uh, the quality of the experience in in our downtown and enjoying our um, our downtown area so I, I'm all for that uh, enhancement of the river edge I'm all for the civic plaza feature um, that uh, Commissioner Kennedy mentioned and others also I really like the idea of having a, a space there right on the bend of the river I mean I, I've always thought that that's a just a wonderful place in fact if you look back in history that is the place where the where the uh, the people of Santa Cruz would watch people uh, when when that was allowed you know when you could um, you know uh, float along on the river and um, use the river and recreate on the river uh, we've outlawed that for some reason um, so I'm I'm really I'm I'm a big fan of that and I, I think the more we can get people to the to the river edge the more we can get people in contact with the water um, you know along the lines of the um, uh, the group the watershed council the uh, coastal watershed council you know they're all about bringing people down to the water edge i think that's a good thing and then uh, as far as the circulation goes um you know taking advantage of the the river levee connecting people to the to the beach with the river levee connecting people with cliff street you know uh, utilizing the stairs utilizing cliff street connecting people another way a shorter way and um you know re redoing our circulation um I, I mentioned earlier about the you know this idea of spruce street, spruce street meeting the river levee i love that i mean uh, no no longer do you have you know this hill that you have to climb it just becomes part of the fabric um the arena location i agree you know uh between pacific and front um i mentioned the building heights and tower i like the towers um you know should they be 160 feet or 200 feet I'm not sure it really makes any difference uh, once you have a tower element of that size um, a few more floors you know really doesn't make any difference I do think the placement of the towers is important and I think uh, I don't I just haven't studied it enough uh, in terms of you know where they are um, but I trust the consultants with their urban design skills can figure out you know where the ideal locations are for those things um, I like the um, the uh, lighting ideas to uh, invite uh, in the in the plaza and the activation features and along the streetscapes. One of the things that um, uh, people often uh, share with me is uh, in our downtown now. Uh, when when I walk around downtown, I, I'm not I'm a big guy. I'm six five, a couple hundred pounds. I'm not scared. I walk down any dark alley I, it just doesn't bother me but I'm I'm a physically large person when I walk with someone who's smaller it's like they're like can we go another way and then, you know it's all about lighting it's all about security and it's all about feeling safe so I think that whole idea of making our downtown feel safe with uh, the kinds of lighting uh, you know decorative artistic you know those features that were uh, brought up by the by the team Count me in. I think that's how we're going to really transform our downtown into a much safer place. You know, that, that feels safe to people, to the users. Um, arena goals. I think we've, you know, we all uh, I think understand those development scenarios, and uh, we want. I want the development downtown. I think that's the logical place for it near the bus station, near a future rail station. Thank you, Pete, for the shout out on the rail thing. Um, that is our future. We we got a, you know, a uh, couple of callers. I, I I was happy to hear people say things like, you know, I, we should get rid of parking minimums. 
Uh, I don't want to see three stories of parking with a building above it. I mean, I, yeah, I think we need to kind of move in a direction where we're not building our city around uh, cars. And so uh, I'm all for the for the transit uh, piece. Um, let's see, did I answer everything that the, yeah, I think I covered pretty much everything that uh, the city, the staff has asked me to comment on. I've given a couple of extra comments um, of my own. And I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I'll go ahead and go to uh, Commissioner Greenberg, and then I'll put myself on deck, and then we'll go to Commissioner Schifrin and then Commissioner Kennedy. So Commissioner Greenberg. Okay, thanks. I'm going to try to speak quickly. Um, just uh, to respond to some points that were made um, by Commissioner Masidi Miller, um, I agree that concerns about displacement should come from the community. And that's one of my concerns is that I don't think we've really sufficiently heard from communities that are going to be impacted or kind of conceived of them as being impacted by this plan. I don't think the, the term displacement has been used at all, it, it, with the exception of direct displacement of individual units within the, within the project area. And um, I think that, uh, you know, in looking at the, the outreach, it's great that there were efforts made with the outreach. I saw like in terms of the demographics, you know, we're 20% Latino. I think there were 6% Latino responses um, amongst the community members. And so I really think it behooves us to make more of an effort. And I know that it's not easy. And I know this was an issue with the objective standards and we hired those wonderful consultants to help us with that, um, to really think about how we include more voices in the impacts of this huge major investment, the first in 20 years, as we've been saying, um, in a market that is already one of the hottest real estate markets in the world. You know, and so we talk about arts-driven gentrification. We talk about green gentrification. We talk about stadium-led gentrification. I mean, we're combining all of it um, in this development. And the potential impact on displacement is massive. And um, we really need to take it seriously. And we really need to include more voices in that conversation. And I, I would say again on the kind of pure supply side um, point, um, yes, we need more supply, but again, to encourage folks to read the new study by the Urban Displacement Project and by Karen Chapel, that we need to balance production with preservation and protection. Production alone, supply alone is not gonna do it for us. Um, on the towers question, I think um, I'm, um, I'm going to I'm going to kind of err on the side of numbers here. I guess I'm less concerned about the design dimension as as long as we can get the um, the numbers. We really need the density. Um, and so I guess I would wonder for Commissioner Schifrin if there's a kind of contingency if we can kind of lead with the importance of getting the density there in this strategic location, um, and if it means adjusting some of the height limits that you know you're concerned about and I think you're saying a lot of the community is concerned about that there's there's some flexibility there um, and so you know insofar as a certain height limit you know your question about whether it can fit if it doesn't fit that there's some flexibility um, and uh, I completely agree with folks on the transportation side and uh, agree about the lack of minimums and the the role of this as a TOD and the potential for a TOD to really open up all kinds of financing capacity from the state um, you know affordable housing sustainable communities grants and other things along those lines and so I think um, transit beyond shuttles you know just transit more broadly um, would be great to lead with on this plan too um, and all of its benefits in terms of you know, the commute shed and greenhouse gas emissions and all of this um, could be a big selling point for this plan. So I, I agree with all those points. Thanks. Okay, I'll go ahead and say a couple things and then we'll go to Commissioner Schifrin and, and then uh, Commissioner Kennedy. So I, I just wanna bring up a couple things that I feel often um, when we have these meetings that um, sort of, the pace at which we're making decisions don't really reflect the potential impacts for the, the decisions that we, we do have an opportunity to weigh in on. And as several people have mentioned, um, 
those opportunities of having impactful decisions at the planning commission are less and less because of state laws. And whether that's good or bad, that's just a fact. And so I think the, the outreach component really got glossed over here um, and we made the pretty graphs, but it, I, I think it's generous to say, and I went back and looked at the numbers that we had 200 unique people make comments at these three outreach events that happened over like the actual time people had to comment was about maybe a month and a half. And 200 is about 0.003% of the population of Santa Cruz. We don't know how many of the 200 to 300 residents who were directly impacted actually were con Yes, they received a letter, but if we want to do this right as a community and actually reflect what the community wants, we need to slow the pace of these things. And that's just a fact. And there are numerous examples um, of planning um, processes and school board processes and diversity plan processes that, you know, it takes a long time to do this. It is really hard to do outreach. People have very busy lives, but I just want to make sure that every, that it's on the public record that what we're moving forward is not a reflection of the majority of the Santa Cruz community, or it, it, is it a reflection of responding to, to these regu these mandates that we're receiving from the state? That's, again, neither here nor there, but presenting, I feel like we often present some of these outreach like it's definitive and it really is reflective of what is happening across the community. And, and I don't think that you can say that 200 unique responses is a, it, we can be confident, statistically confident, that that reflects the whole of our community. Now on to the actual substance. So, I, and I, I think Commissioner um, Nisidi Miller talked about the displacement and that the community should be um, part of that discussion. It's gonna take extra time and effort to make that community part of the discussion about displacement. So just saying displacement is important I don't think is, is, is very impactful or useful. So if we think displacement is important, we have to make recommendations. And that's our, our charge is to be an advisory body to the council who are the decision makers. So if we think it's important, then we need to make discrete recommendations about how, how we think it's important and how it could be reflected in a policy or a direction that the council has given. So I, I find myself very frustrated um, around the out outreach. So for the actual um, substance uh, of um, this plan, um, I, I also feel like this is being presented as like we've got to cram all of our arena numbers into this location. And uh, frankly, I live in a, a, you know, I on the block I live on, there's two single family houses there's two story, everything all around. I live over in the Seabright area, kind of around Galt Street. Um, you know, there's opportunities all over the city for that type of development. Um, the city is choosing not to place that development in places like the West Side and some of the places that are low, that are zoned for lower density. So that's a, that's a policy choice that we're making. So again, let's just be honest about the choices that we're making. Um, I think there is an incredible opportunity in this area to put a lot of units. And I am absolutely would be willing to support that middle road. Um, I don't think that we really need to have, you know, a specific design element part of that. But I think the 1600 units seems reasonable. Um, I'm really, I am really concerned about the displacement, however. Um, as far as the, some of the other elements, um, I think the board and care facility, I, I agree with many of the commissioners who said, we need to like codify that in writing that things cannot go forward until there is a relocation of those 48. And I'm not sure of the cost structure. I think it's privately owned. So as part of that relocation, we need to make sure that if somebody isn't is it is it on Medicaid or someone else is covering the government is covering the cost in some way for that board and care 
that it's not going to be an increased cost to the resident so that a resident might not actually be able to move into the new facility and get the same board and care. So again, I'm not sure if that's an issue, but if it is, I, I would just be very supportive of something like that going in um, with that and just agree with other commissioners. Um, I, I really think that this idea of continuing to have to study upping the inclusionary doesn't make any sense and isn't reflective of the data available. Um, we know that other cities have done this. Mr. Greenberg actually gave specific examples about redevelopment of downtown areas and upping the inclusionary. Um, we have um, one of the most uh, sought after development areas in the world. And so people will make it work to develop here because there is such opportunity here. So um, I would be very supportive of upping the inclusionary rate so that we um, are putting uh, more development for the lower income levels. Um, and I think, um, I think about the realignment um, again, I mean, I think, I could be supportive of that if, if we had some really specific um, recommendations so that we, we ensure that board and care facility isn't going to be lost. And then the arena, I think it does absolutely make sense um, for a lot of reasons. I think the warriors are important to a lot of folks in town um, and having them not have to move out of town while the construction of the new facility and just that location in general, I think better suits their needs. So I'm totally supportive of that. Um, and I also am really supportive of us um, living up to the charge we have as an advisory body um, to, to try to come up with something that we could all live with um, and, and move it forward as a preferred alternative. Again, it's just advice for the council to consider, but I think aggregating all the thoughtful comments that we've had today and trying to come up with something that we can agree on. And I, I heard of a, a lot of agreement uh, along some of the major points. I would be very supportive of that as well. Um, I'll stop there. Go ahead over to Commissioner Schifrin. I'm going to start with a question to Steph because one of the issues is kind of a timing issue. Um, will the plan or the uh, draft plan or whatever call it now, <clears throat> come back to us before it goes to the council with a re recommended preferred alternative. Hi, um, yeah, so at, at this point, what we're hoping to do is to take um, all of the feedback from your commission, from the downtown commission and from the public, um, including any motion that it comes out of tonight's meeting uh, to the city council with either a preferred alternative or preferred options. So, you know, like I had mentioned there, we may have more than one option that we want to study. Um, and then the next time we would be back to the planning commission with, would be when we have draft language for the plan that really gets into all of the details about all of the specific, like what is exactly the location of the tower? Um, you know, what are the, you know, specific urban design features, all of, all of that stuff. So that would be the next time we would be coming back to your commission. Would that be after the EIR or before the EIR? That would be um, after the EIR. Yeah, so the EIR would be complete. We would have a final set of plan amendments and a, and a draft of the EIR together. So at that point, the commission would be deciding whether to recommend the uh, alternative that had been through the EIR and was recommended by staff. Is that correct? Right, or one of the options that was in the EIR, yeah. You know, I think um, as uh, Chair Dawson has said, it is a legitimate role for the commission to have to make its own independent recommendation. I appreciate that when staff goes to the council, they will make a recommendation as to what would be the preferred alternative based on um, all the input they've received and their um, best professional judgment. And I think that's totally legitimate. But as a planning commission, I think it's uh, not only legitimate, but important for us to exercise an independent, our own independent judgment in terms of making a reckon, recommendation on a, on a preferred alternative. 
because that's what's going to be uh, go to the go through the EIR process. And any change to that will be very um, could be very difficult to do. I wanted to, and you know, there, and I think I'm. I don't remember, and and uh, Sarah will correct me about why it's important to move forward quickly. But um, because I think, as Chair Dawson said, this is the this is a big deal. Um, why not have more community outreach? Why not have more discussion at the commission? I think we have a grant. Uh, the city's received a grant. There are um, um, pressures on the city to move this process forward. And I think one of the biggest pressures is, a, is the Warriors. They want to know whether they're going to have a location or not. And um, this process is going to tell them whether they're going to have a location. So let me respond to that because I was a little concerned about one of the comments that uh, Commissioner Steve Miller um, made about the Warriors. Uh, I started out really agreeing that the Warriors were really important. We really wanted to be, them to be here. But trying to tie them to finding a location for um, uh, for the, uh, a new location for the uh, boarding care facility is, um, I think, a losing strategy. The Warriors have been trying to do that for several years. Um, the county's been working with them. And it is, one, it is a private company, and it is very difficult to find another location. The county has looked at a series of locations. The owner is not particularly interested in moving. If the, the county wants them to move or the city wants them to move, it's going to be up to the city or the county or the warriors to find their own place and, it's, and to pay for it. They're not, they're not going to be willing to spend any money for it. So if that becomes the precondition for the warriors to be able to stay here, um, I think we're going to lose them. That's, that's my own personal opinion on that. So that's why I think we really need to dis you know, disconnect the decision on the, uh, the board and care facility from um, one, the war where the warriors go or when they go uh, to a new facility, and two, the uh, relocation, uh, the realignment of the Wall Street, um, Wall Street extension. Because I just, you know, as I'm not a basketball fan, honestly, but I think the Warriors have been a real plus for the community, and I really uh, appreciate them being here, and I want them to stay. Um, but I don't, um, you know, it's it's not going to happen if it's if we're we're if it gets caught up with them. At the board and care facility, and I think it's going to make it more difficult to, de to develop the housing if the the owners of the property don't know, you know, whether the street's going to be here or is the street going to be there? Are we going to be able to move that look uh, that facility? Are we not? It's on a separate parcel I understand from the staff, so it doesn't have to be incorporated into everything else. But I think it really at least would make sense for. The consultants to design a real, um, a real, real line street that would be close to the housing and create the uh, the existing housing and create some um, you know separate or uh, separate spaces for new housing development that would uh, encourage them to be able to move forward because they know where they were going to be able to go. Um, so that's that's that. In terms of teacher housing, I just want, I want to follow up on something that uh, Commissioner Greenberg said. I was on the subcommittee that worked on that. We ultimately recommended to the council amendment to the inclusionary ordinance to encourage uh, um, housing for teachers. And it's difficult financially. We did what the school district asked us to do in terms of removing what they considered an impediment to their moving forward. Um, but inclusionary requirements are not the only problem that developers have in building a project. So certainly the school district has other projects and you know the city's had a committee in the past to work with the school district and this may be um, as a strong concern for you, Commissioner Kennedy, 
it could benefit from you really immersing yourself in the issue and trying to figure out a way to make it happen. My own feeling is it's a financial problem. It's not a regulatory problem. That from a regulatory point of view, they could get through the process right away. The problem is they don't have the financial resource to build the housing. And it's not the only way you can get subsidies is for 100% very low income or low income housing. And that's not where many of the teachers are. So it's a very difficult conundrum. I do disagree with you, Commissioner Kennedy, when your statement about, well, let's build our high density here so we don't have to have a bad building along the corridors. Unfortunately, under the general plan and the mixed use high density housing along the corridors, it's not up to us anymore. It's up to developers coming forward with projects. It's going to be very difficult for the commit for the city to turn them down under the new state law. And the state law does not really make it. So I hope you're wrong. We saw with the project at Grants of Forty on Water, some people felt it was too much. Some people felt it was fine. But the fact was the city was very, very constrained in its ability to influence it at all. And that is likely to happen at a number of other sites along the corridors. And hopefully they won't be bad buildings. Hopefully the developers will try to work with the community and the neighborhoods to have decent buildings. That was what was done in Watsonville on an SB35 project. And hopefully it will be done here. But under the new laws, the general plan rules. If the general plan says you can have multi-high density housing, you not only can have multi-family high density housing, you can get a density bonus on top of that. I didn't understand the notion that somehow by lowering the height, we were going to lose the open space. That certainly wasn't my proposal. I don't think it was necessary. This won't be the first time I disagree with Commissioner Christine Miller, but I love Paris. I love walking around Paris. It's one of the finest times I've had is just enjoying the ambiance of the Paris neighborhood. Let me just finish by, you know, before, in terms of my responses to comments, that I think it's very legitimate for the commission to recommend to the council that they initiate a process for considering the displacement impact, the off-site displacement impacts of the plan. And they can decide to do it. They can decide not to do it. But I don't think there's anything amiss in the commission recommending that they take this issue seriously and initiate a process to do something about it. It's a legitimate function, especially since the city doesn't have a housing commission, doesn't have a permanent housing subcommittee working on these housing issues. It's kind of fallen to us by default, and it's created all sorts of problems for us along the way. But I think given that that's the reality, it's legitimate for us to raise the issue. So I would like to make a motion. I'm going to make a motion. I can either make a comprehensive motion and see whether the, how I'm trying, some of the things, there certainly won't be consensus. Other things, I think there is consensus. I could do it as a comprehensive motion. I could make a series of motions. I don't, it's, you know, it's a, there are, the staff has asked for our input. I think the best way of giving our input besides just as individual commission, commissioners is as a commission through a recommendation by a motion. So I'm going to move that the planning commission recommend to the city council the following as the preferred alternative for the downtown expansion general plan amendment for consideration in the secret document. 
Number one, the site of the arena will be in the area between Pacific Avenue and Front Street. Number two, in order to strike a balance between providing significant new housing and not changing the character of the downtown area in a more extreme way, additional high density housing shall be uh, provided adjacent to the San Lorenzo River. Total number of new units um, in the expansion area shall not exceed 1,600 and to the extent feasible, housing for educators should be included. I guess I just changed that a little bit to say uh, the majority of additional uh, high density housing um, would be um, adjacent to the San Lorenzo River because from the scenarios, it looks like there's some proposed high density housing on other sites and I think that's legitimate. Number three, the building heights for new development in the expansion area shall not exceed the height of the tallest building in the downtown area uh, after a density bonus benefit as long as 1,600 new units can be provided. So I think that you know, from what we're hearing, although we have no uh, specific information, it's probably going to require a greater height which would be acceptable because the, uh, the basic thing is to get the new units. The Laurel Street extension, if relocated, shall be closer to the, uh, shall not, if it shall be closer to the hillside without requiring the demolition of the existing special needs housing unless a relocated facility has been provided. Let me read that again since I locked it up. The Laurel Street extended extension, if relocated, shall be closer to the hillside without requiring the demolition of the existing special needs housing unless a relocated facility has been provided. Next one is at least one third of the total new higher density housing units in the expansion area shall be affordable to lower income housing households and the inclusionary requirement for individual projects shall be 25% 30% requirement for projects with density bonuses. New developments that displaces existing low-income residents shall provide replacement affordable units on a one-to-one -one basis and shall not be counted towards meeting a project's inclusion, inclusionary requirement, which I think is the current ordinance requirement. Uh, in order to minimize the potential impact of the proposed plan on additional displacement of affordable housing within the plan area and in the surrounding areas, particularly beach flats and lower ocean, an advisory committee of residents and affordable housing experts shall be formed to study and recommend effective mitigation measures in coordination with the planning commission. The EIR on the, on the plan shall contain an analysis of the potential impacts on the environment of displacement that may result from the plan and shall include appropriate mitigation measures. The plan should include pro the proposals the commission has received for the civic prop plaza, lighting and connectivity between the beach area and the downtown. And finally, public transit should be a central component of the plan. That would be my motion, uh, if it gets a second. I'm, I'm happy to second that motion. Um, Commissioner Schifrin, would you be able to um, forward that language to the clerk? Um, so she just would have all of that at her disposal. Um, when we have it read back? Uh, let me, yes. That is the answer. I will, I think I'll send it to Sarah. Is that okay, Sarah? Uh, Sarah got promoted to the county internal planner, so would you best send it to me? And I think he means me. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, I'm still here. Okay. I have been promoted nowhere. Um, that scared me. You can send it to me, but you should send it to Tess also because she writes up the minutes. 
Yeah, and you, you can both forward it to me, Commissioner Schiffer, and then I can make sure Sarah Noisy and um, Tess. Somehow yeah, I've yeah. lost Tess's email. Um, yeah, if you send it to me, I can get it to Tess. That's fine. Okay. And I think Commissioner Thank Kennedy you. had his hand up. I don't know if that was just still there. Yeah. Yeah. But was we're, that from we're, before? We're, yeah. Okay. We're getting there. Okay. okay. So um, we got that out. We got a, a motion in a second over to Commissioner Kennedy. I was feeling like compromise might be possible in the 1600, but there's way too many other things on there for me personally. Um, I don't know. Um, so I had two more quick points just in general I forgot to make earlier. So I'm going to wedge those in and then maybe respond to Commissioner Schifrin's comments briefly. Um, you know, the Warriors Stadium is kind of proof of concept that we don't need more parking down there. At that hearing, there was like tremendous concern about no parking and it's worked out great. And um, the last thing I want to mention is that public bathrooms are super important uh, for the community in those public spaces. And it's like, it's the worst thing that all that stuff that happens with public bathrooms. But um, as a dad, I appreciate them a lot more than I did five years ago, you know. So uh, those are two quick comments. Um, so Commissioner Shippen, I really, truly uh, appreciate your um, history with with teacher housing and stuff. So thanks for reminding me of that. Uh, I'm new to some of these items. Um, I just, I really, uh, I'm not going to support this motion. I really bristle, honestly, and I'm taking deep breaths at the idea that we should slow this process down. This process, in my mind, began in 1990 after the earthquake on North Pacific, and it's just continuing. Um, we need housing and I mean, obviously climate change. I think this is part of that solution. We need that now. So with honor for the process and dragging things out and getting everyone's input and all that, that's great. Um, the chair can agendize items, put an item on the agenda, put it on the agenda and we'll talk about that at, at the appropriate time. But shoehorning all this stuff into this plan just again, strikes me as inappropriate. So um, that's where I'm at with it. I'm not going to vote for any motion. And I, I feel like I've given staff my opinion. So um, I'll stop there. Commissioner Conway. Thank you. Yeah, I actually was feeling like th I, there's a lot of points here that I do agree with. I would also vote against this motion um, and for one thing, I think it is really not allowing the process to work itself through. I really appreciate the comments and they have been made to council and they will be considered as such. Um, um, I was actually going to be fine with 1600. That was actually the number I was most comfortable with anyway, but I don't, um, agree with a, um, it, it actually kind of reminds me of the, um, parties that you went to in high school where everyone brought a bottle and poured it into a garbage can. Um, and I, I don't think it's helpful. Um, I appreciate all the points. I really appreciate the discussion. Um, but the, the, the two things that disturb me the most is to have a building height limited to the Palomar. Um, that's just antiquated. It's a different time and it really does not, um, I, I, I mean, I'm, it leaves me incredulous that that's proposed, frankly. Um, and then once again, I do not know what the right number of affordable units and what the right depth of affordable units are. I do know a fair amount about the math that makes a project feasible. And it disturbs me that we can rush through any analysis of that, but we want to slow down. Um, when, um, you know, to talk about things that don't specifically pertain um, to this planning process. So I will be voting against the motion as it's presented. Uh, over to Commissioner Missy Miller. No, thank you for uh, the comments. I'll, I'll just, um, without repeating, um, Commissioner Kennedy and Commissioner Conway's 
comments. I'll agree with their comments. I would add that um, I feel pretty strongly that this is not the time to, you know, toss a new inclusionary requirement or a new affordable housing requirement onto a broad area of our community without an extra study and all the other things that have to be done in order to make sure that we're, you know, not going to kill housing. Um, there are some things I agree with. I agree that the site arena um, or the location of the arena, I agree that the number of 1600 units, I think the displacement on a one-to-one -one is already city uh, standard. So I, I don't think there's anything about that that I would change. Um, but I'd, I'd like to take this opportunity to make a substitute motion. And my substitute motion will be pretty simple. And that is that um, the planning commission, uh, I mean, my motion would be that the staff take into account the comments that the planning commissioners have made tonight. Take those into account as you move forward in further developing uh, this project area plan. And that you include our uh, comments uh, and the comments of the public and the other um, commissions that you'll be working with as as you refine the plan for presentation to the city council. So that's that's my substitute motion. I would second that. Okay, we have uh, a substitute motion on the floor. I believe the parliamentary procedure now is that we would go ahead and take a vote on that motion first. Is staff, can you help me out? Is that where we go? You first need to um, take a vote on whether to accept the substitute motion. Okay. I thought I was and missing then, a then you would debate, sorry, then you would debate that motion and then you would vote on the actual motion. So the first vote, I know it's, it's pretty weird. The first vote would be whether to accept the substitute motion. Yeah. I thought there was a step in there. Okay, great. Yes. So we will go ahead and take a vote. Can I ask a quick question? Can there be two motions or you can only have one motion? There can only be a substitute. You can't have two. So, yeah. Well, somebody can do another substitute motion after we act on this motion. Is that correct? Uh, there could be friendly amendments. So, um, you know, there, once it, you vote on whether or not to accept the um, substitute motion, then it opens up discussion again. So, that could have, uh, but I, I believe that you can only have two motions, two formal motions on the floor at once, but I will have to reference my parliamentary procedures to confirm that. Because I personally support both motions on some level, so, <laughs> but I don't know if that's possible. Like I, I so, like motion two, you know, but we can't, we can't do that. Yeah. Let's go ahead and take this in order. So okay. what we're right. doing now, is there is a motion on the floor to formally direct staff. I, I'm paraphrasing and Commissioner Mercedes Miller, please jump in if I am paraphrasing incorrectly. To formally direct staff to include everything they've heard tonight in their deliberations and present presentation to city council about the expansion. Is that more or less correct, Commissioner Mercedes Miller? That's correct. More or less, yeah. Okay. I have to email it. But that is not the motion on the floor. Motion that, on the floor. Part, I'm sorry, the substitute motion. The substitute motion, which we're going to act on right now, and what you are voting on as a commissioner right now is whether ex to accept that motion formally on the floor. And if we accept the motion, then we can have a discussion, and then we will vote yes or no on that motion. Then we will go back to the original motion, which has a second, and take a vote on that. Okay, so well, let me clarify, if the substitute motion passes, it's a substitute for the original motion. So the original okay. motion is no longer... Um, right, okay. The, the original motion has been replaced, <laughs> as, as okay. I understand it. Okay. So, okay, that's a very important point. So if we are, accept this substitute motion, the original motion is no longer on the floor. No, so, if we if we accept the uh, the the substitute motion, then we passes. debate the substitute motion, and if the substitute motion passes, then the original motion disappears. But all we're voting on now is whether we want to debate the substitute motion. We're not voting to approve or disapprove the substitute motion. Yep, 
I, I'm sorry I misspoke, but okay. yes, again, one more time for clarity for all of us and the public. What we are voting on right now is to accept the substitute motion onto the floor. Then there can be discussion and then there will be a vote. If that motion is approved, the original motion will have been replaced and that will be the action. Okay. But you could always just make that motion again so Miriam can vote for both. Okay. That was my question. Once we're done with all that kerfuffle, you just like say the same thing again, right? Yeah, I thought that um, Lee Butler was checking on that, but maybe. Uh, Well, that's my understanding. I could be wrong. Yeah, I I agree with that. It's certainly possible to have more than one motion on an item that's before the commission. So you're right. I agree with Commissioner Kennedy that. the commission could approve the original motion and then also approve uh, uh, the motion that uh, Commissioner Mastini Miller made or um, the other way around. Keeping in mind, you also have to make a motion in four minutes to extend the meeting to adjourn at a date uh, at a time. Uh, I, I move to extend the meeting. So when? Uh, so let's say until 11 15. We already have two motions on the floor right now. So, you want to finish on. the motion yes, that we you got have to, on the floor? We got to clear the deck. Things you are getting out of hand. Uh, we got to clear one of these off so we can make another motion. So, um, or is, is, is the substitute motion not officially on the floor because we haven't accepted it? Is that right? I think we can do the three votes in four minutes. Let's do it. To it. I would. Let's so, do it. I think you've got some options. I think you've Go got ahead. some options. Um, while it is not, I, I, I believe that parliamentary procedure has that uh, two motions. So a motion and a substitute motion are on the floor, but not another substitute motion after that. Um, I would, I would uh, argue that the time extension is a separate item. For simplicity's sake, I would argue that time extensions is a separate item and um, would uh, suggest that you all just go ahead and, and make the motion separately um, to, um, in, to extend the time. Sure we we stay in that. session until 11.15. I second. Okay, let's do a vote on the extension. Ready, uh, test, roll call, please. Aye. 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 Okay, we're extended to 11.15. Back to the substitute motion. This, this well, is I would motion. call for a question on whether to consider the substitute motion. Okay, great. Uh, so let's vote on uh, the substitute motion. The question has been called, so that means we go straight to a vote. Um, a yes or no vote on accepting Commissioner M- C.D. Miller's motion. Does I'm anybody sorry, have any? Does, does this cancel out the other motion? I'm sorry. If we, I'm sorry. No. It just um, allows us we... to vote on the substitute. That's motion. the next vote. Yeah, this is the vote of whether to accept it. We haven't done that yet. We're just accepting it to the floor for debate and discussion, right? Correct. Yeah, okay. Okay, so uh, this is whether we're accepting the floor for debate. Uh, Go ahead and have a roll call test. Commissioner Conway. Aye. 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 Kind of hard to hear you, Tess. Yeah, there's a lot of, lot of reverb there. Mr. Conway, discussion of the motion on the floor to formally direct uh, planning staff to consider everything they've heard today in their report to council. Um, the, what this motion does is direct staff to do their job and to pass all of our communication and discussion onto council for their discussion. 
and I strongly support it. Great. Any other comments before we vote? Yes. Um, let me ask staff a question. Will the staff do this irrespective of whether there is this function passes or not? Seems to me that's what the staff always does. They take everybody's, that's what they said they were going to do. I think this motion is superfluous. Uh, I'm not going to support it because I think um, it, you know, it just is telling staff to do uh, what their job is, as, as Commissioner Conway says. Uh, we don't need to tell them their job. They know their job. Um, and they're going to do their job. The question is, should the commission make its own separate recommendation? That's the original motion. And this is to, substitute, to approve this as a substitute motion is saying that we'd rather have the staff speak for us rather than speak for ourselves. And I'm sure that if the original motion passes, the staff will, um, when it goes to the council, will tell the council what a majority of the commission recommended. And it will also tell the council what all the commissioners uh, opinions were about particular issues. So it's not like we need this substitute motion um, in order to get the staff to fully disclose to the council what uh, what's going on here tonight. Um, and therefore, I'm going to vote against the substitute motion. Over to Commissioner Kennedy, then Commissioner Greenberg on deck, and then we're going to go ahead and go to a vote. I, I submit the substitute motion would also be sending a message to council on what we're unified on. Go ahead, Commissioner Greenberg. Um, I hear what is being said. I think that we need as much democratic voice as possible. We are a commission that's been appointed independent of the staff and it's good for us to, you know, sometimes voice ideas and we're representing constituencies and concerns and ideas, you know, in our positions here. And it's good for us to, to say things about, you know, in, in, in an advisory capacity to the council. Um, and I agree it's a good point. I mean, it's kind of superfluous. The staff is going to do what the staff always does and does a very wonderful job of doing what the staff does, which is to um, represent the discussion we've had and to, you know, and they're going to continue to do that. So, um, uh, I mean, I understand the cons the issue if people wanted to split the motion, I guess, like if there were certain parts of the motion they agreed with and didn't agree with, and we want to talk on that, on that level. I happen to agree with everything that was said, and I felt like it really captured um, a lot of points of consensus. I mean, I, I do agree with Commissioner Conway about the height concern, um, and, I'm, and I made the point, and I think the way from what I understood that it was worded is that if it's not feasible to have that height constraint uh, in order to accomplish the 1,600 units, that that uh, it would be, it's kind of, in, in that sense, I think the height restraint is a bit irrelevant, but I, you know, I think I'm willing to to deal with that because I think it's it's kind of mitigated by the fact that it, it may not accomplish the 1600 units. Um, but otherwise, I think that um, I do support, um, you know, what's what else is in the, the motion. So, and I think it's good to, to have a, a voice from the commission. So, that's my feeling. Okay, go ahead and go to a vote for the substitute motion, which paraphrased is directing staff to formally present um, our everything they've heard tonight to the commission. I will say before we go to the vote, just quickly, that the staff has said several times, all the staff we've heard from, that that is, is exactly their intention. Um, so it's been stated publicly in the public forum that that was the that's what they were going to do. Um, so let's go ahead and go to a vote for the. Can substitute. I ask you a quick question again? Sorry. So if we vote yes on this, that means we can't vote on the other one. Just to clarify, I'm so tired that I can't remember what was said about that. That's yeah. correct, unless somebody remakes the motion. Is that correct, Mr. That's Butler? Correct. That's correct. There would need to be a new motion. But you, there's nothing that says you can't make another motion on this particular item. So if if this is a yes then you'd have to make a new motion. So if you vote yes, then I'm going to have to repeat the whole motion all over again. 
<laughs> at 11.05. But it'll be worth it because we'll be unified on one thing. Okay, so uh, please roll call vote on Commissioner Mercedes uh, Miller's substitute motion. This is to accept the motion. And if we accept the motion, the other motion on the floor will be removed and we will have a clean slate to go from. So, uh, Tess, roll call, please. Commissioner Conway? Aye. Greenberg? Aye. Kennedy? Aye. Maxwell? No. Ms. Heedy Miller? Aye. Schifrin? No. Dawson? No. Okay, so a motion passes four to three. Uh, are there any other commissioners that would like to make a motion? Yes, I'd like to make a motion to move that the Planning Commission recommend to the City Council um, the following as the preferred alternative for the downtown expansion general plan amendment for consideration in the CEQA document. This, uh, Number one, the site of the arena will be in the area between Pacific Avenue and Front Street. Number two, in order to strike a balance between providing significant new housing and not changing the character of the downtown area in an extreme way, the majority of the additional high-density housing shall be provided adjacent to the San Lorenzo River. The total number of new units in the expansion area shall not exceed uh, 1,600 units, and to the extent feasible, Housing for education, uh, educators should be included. The building heights for the new development in the expansion area shall not exceed the height of the tallest building in the downtown area asked for a density bonus, as long as 1,600 new units can be provided. The Laurel Street extension, if relocated, shall be closer to the hillside without requiring the demolition of existing special, the existing special needs housing unless a relocated facility has been provided. At least one third of the total new higher density housing units in the expansion area shall be affordable to lower income households and the inclusionary requirement for individual projects shall be 25% with a 30% requirement for projects with density bonuses. New developments that dis uh, displace existing low income residents shall provide replacement affordable units on a one-to-one -one basis and shall not be counted towards meeting a project's inclusionary requirement. In, uh, the next one is in order to minimize the potential impact of the proposed plan on additional displacement of affordable housing within the plan area and in surrounding areas, particularly beach flats and lower ocean, an advisory committee of residents and affordable housing experts shall be formed to study and recommend effective mitigation measures in coordination with the Planning Commission. The EIR on the plan shall contain an analysis of the potential impacts on the environment of displacement that may result from the plan and shall include appropriate mitigation measures. The plan should include the proposals uh, presented to the Commission for the Civic Plaza lighting and connectivity between the beach area and downtown and public transit finally shall be a central component of the plan. That is uh, my motion. Okay, thank you. I'd second that motion. We have a motion on the floor. Um, do we wanna make a, this just as a reminder, this is the same motion that was on the floor about a half an hour or 45 minutes ago. So we've had discussion. Are there any additional points people would like to discuss? Commissioner Masidi Miller. Yeah, I'd like to uh, offer a friendly amendment. Uh, I'd like uh, to uh, suggest that uh, the motion be amended to remove the height restriction to not exceed the heights of any uh, of the tallest building in downtown, which is the St. George at whatever it is, 100 feet, and that the um, number of units be met by the use of uh, base height buildings uh, as proposed by staff with um, towers as needed and uh, towers placed uh, in such a way to be um, aesthetically attractive from a 
and, and the view from Cliff Street be considered. Um, okay. Uh, I'm not willing to uh, accept that as a friendly amendment. Okay, moving back to the floor. Any other additional discussion before we go to a vote? Can I, I will say that, oh, go ahead, Commissioner Greenberg. I didn't put my hand up, so make, yeah. <laughs> well, it is now. <laughs> would you okay. Would you like to say something? Yes, um, that was rude. Uh, I, uh, so we're all very tired, I realize. Um, so, and the whole business with the friendly amendments, are there ways of discussing how it might be altered in some way? If you have a proposed language, you would you should make it. Otherwise, I call for the question. Okay. Um, that brings us to a vote, and he gave you the opportunity to have specific language, something like what Com Commissioner Missidi Miller just proposed. Specific language that I would suggest? Yeah. Okay. As, as the amendment. Um, that the language around the heights of the downtown not be included. Okay, I think that was pretty much the same motion as the <laughs> well, Commissioner Missidi Miller. Commissioner Ms. Miller had, you know, other points, I guess, about this, you know, aesthetics and views. And I'm stuff not like willing to um, accept that as a friendly amendment. I don't think that's a friendly amendment. I really okay. oppose the towers, and I don't think uh, I'm, I, 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 I think I'm, I understand that the height will be higher than what uh, will probably, although we don't have the information, we don't have any evidence that it can't be met. I'm not offended by buildings that don't have towers, and I've agreed to 1,600 units. Um, I've agreed to all sorts of things that. Um, you know, matter less to me, <clears throat> to me. Okay. So I think okay, we should so vote on the motion. So that puts us to a vote. Uh, the question is that called that closes okay. debate. And so can, we're going to. Can I just ask a friendly amendment? Can we um, split that one off from the rest of it or no? Is that. Well, the question has been called. So um, Mr. Butler, could you weigh in here and help me out at 11 12? There needs to be there needs to be a motion to um, accept the uh, call the question. Um, okay. And then a, and the the commission could vote to extend the time again. I don't see any reason why they couldn't do that if they so choose to do so. Okay. So does that call of the question needs a second and a vote? Is that correct? That's correct. It does. Okay. I will second the call the question. Um, and this is uh, basically taking us to a vote. Uh, so that's what we're going to be voting on, a yes or a no. Yes, we go straight to a vote. No, we it's open for discussion. Tess, can you go ahead and uh, roll call vote, please? Commissioner Conway? Um, this is to accept the call to question. Aye. Greenberg? Uh, aye. Kennedy? Yes. Sorry, Miriam. Maxwell? Okay. Hey. Miller? No. Diffrin? Aye. Dawson? Aye. Motion passes to call the question, so we're going to a vote on Commissioner Schifrin's motion. Does anybody, would anybody like the clerk to read the entire motion before we vote or does every is everybody good good okay we're, okay we're voting on commissioner Schifrin's motion uh tess please uh go ahead and uh roll call vote please mr conway no greenberg aye kennedy no maxwell aye cd miller no. Schifrin? Aye. Dawson? Aye. Motion passes four to three. I think we're going to need um, another extension uh, to get through the rest of the agenda here. I would move we that we continue the item number four to our next meeting. <laughs> I second that motion. 
That's a, uh, so we have a motion in a second to continue item four to our next meeting. Uh, Tess, do we have a roll call vote? Commissioner Conway. Sorry, Catherine. Aye. Uh, Greenberg. Aye. Kennedy. Aye. Maxwell. Aye. Cassidy Miller. No. Different. Aye. Dawson. Aye. Um, I still, I think, technically need a, another, unless we can get through it in like 30 seconds, maybe we can. Uh, I move to extend second. the meeting for five more minutes. Second. Second. Can we just have a vote by affirmation? Sounds good. Aye. 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 Okay. Aye. <laughs> thank, thank you, Commissioner Kennedy. Uh, so subcommittee advisory body oral reports. Anything else that we need to hear from staff? Yeah, just really, really quickly from staff. Go ahead. Thanks, Chair. Uh, just a few quick updates. Uh, City Council approved the first reading of the slope ordinance amendments that were recommended by the Planning Commission last month. Uh, they That went to Council last week. Uh, and then on May 19th, Planning Commission, we have Two items in addition to the continued item tonight. That's the, we have a, a zoning ordinance amendment package, uh, largely containing cleanup items that will be going, uh, as well as our capital improvement plan uh, in general plan conformance review. That's required uh, for first day requirements prior to the budget being adopted. And then uh, objective development standards uh, that's that's a large large project we've been working on for a while. That is going to planning commission in June. Uh, given the size of that project, we've elected to split it up into two pieces, uh, and so we'll be going to both June meetings, the June second and June sixteenth meeting, on the objective development standards item. That's it from Great. staff. Oh, uh, Mr. Marlette, did you have any something else for us? I was just going to add that the planning or the uh, city council approved the 415 natural bridges uh, affordable housing project at its April 26th meeting. Well, great. Uh, I just had one quick question: is so is the capital review is that an action item or just a uh, the capital improvement project? Is that an action item or just an informational item for the May 19th meeting? It it is an action item. Uh, planning commission would would have a motion to accept it. Okay, great. Um, I see uh, Commissioner Mercedes Miller and then Commissioner Schifrin. Uh, I, uh, how would I get a copy of the motion that was approved tonight? I have it. Could you forward that to me, please? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Schifrin. I have two questions. One about the capital improvement plan do we just accept it or do we have to find that it's consistent with the general plan? That's correct. You're um, making a finding that the projects proposed are consistent with the general plan and making that recommendation to the council. And yeah, that's what focus, I thought. Okay, thanks. Yeah, yep, we focus on the new items. Um, so CIP items that are carryovers from prior years are not presented, it'll just be the new ones. And really the only question before us is, is the project consistent with the general plan? You've got it. Okay. The other question I have is about uh, the status of the proposed hotel downtown. Um, could we get an update on what's going on with that project? Eric, you wanna give the latest on that? Yeah, at this point, it's, it remains incomplete. So we're waiting for a complete determination before we move on to the environmental review phase. Oh, okay. So there's not a complete application at this time. Right. Okay, thank you. Okay, great. Any other commissioners have any questions for staff? Um, I just want to thank all of my fellow commissioners. I want to thank staff for a really, um, really robust report that uh, provided a ton of information to us and the public and uh, for everybody hanging in there, in there for the, the long one here we had tonight. Um, this is important stuff and everybody's input is, is really, really valuable. 
Uh, thank you again to my colleagues and staff and to the public. And with that, I will call the May 5th uh, City of Santa Cruz Planning Commission into adjournment. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Good night.